השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, here in Aventura Isles, continuing our series, um, we uh, have only two Mishnayot left, two Mishnayot left before the siyum of this monumental series that we've been doing for the last couple of years. If, uh, if it were a book that we put together, which Bezat Hashem, if Hashem uh, allows, we will put it in a book format, it will probably be a series of like a Musar Encyclopedia, the series, um, and a, uh, it's a, uh, amazing that we're actually at this point that there's only two Mishnayot left. Now, of course, by our way of Kiddusha, where we try to sanctify Hashem's name in every way possible, so we're not going to speed up anything. We're going to continue doing things as they are, which most likely would mean that today's Mishnah will probably be more than one Shiul, uh, maybe two, maybe three. depends how deep we go into it. It may end up being one. I don't know. It depends. depends what Hashem wants. It uh, depends how deep we go into things. Uh, but then after this Mishnah, we have only one Mishnah left. And then we have to decide uh, what's the next series. I know a few people have given me suggestions. I appreciate the suggestions. Um, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm only going to start thinking about the uh, next series once we actually get to that point. And the reason why is because most people that have anxiety, which is unfortunately most people, the reason why they have anxiety about their problems in life, whether it's money problems, marriage problems, divorce problems, kids problems, health problems, all types of problems. Baruch Hashem, this is a world of problems. And that's the way the world, that's the way Hashem wants it to be. Because problems are a way that you're supposed to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But anyway, the reason why people, there's some people that, most people, they have problems and they get anxious, nervous, depressed. And there's a few tzaddikim that it seems like they don't have any problems until you get to meet them. And you see, they actually not only have problems, sometimes they have more problems than most people. But the difference is they treat them differently. They treat the problems differently. They look at the problems differently. Without going in too deep into that issue, one of the reasons, one of the reasons is because the overwhelming majority of anxiety that people have is actually about problems they don't have. It's problems they think they will have because of the way things look today. So, for example, a person is worried about not having money to pay the rent two weeks before the rent is due. So, yes, you're right. Today, if the rent was due today, you would not be able to pay it because you don't have the money. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu designed the world in such a way that today you don't have to pay the rent. It's due on the 15th. You still have two weeks. That's plenty of time for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to do whatever he needs to do to make sure that the money shows up. That's why the Gemara in Masechet Brachot has Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokinos. Rabbi Eliezer Agadol says someone that has food to eat today but is worried about tomorrow is, uh, has problems with emuna. Has a tiny little baby emuna. Meaning... This person is worried about something that hasn't happened yet. People are worried about not finding a zivug. Why are they not finding a zivug? Because they haven't found one today. Are you 85 yet? Oh no, you're still 20, you're still 25, you're still marriageable age. You're still, uh, you know, you're still able to function, you're still able to walk, you're still able to see, you're not walking around with a cane. Okay, so the time didn't come. People are worried now, I'm not going to have to do something, I have to do something. Many women come to me asking me the same question. What's the question? Should I freeze my eggs? Should I freeze my eggs? Why? Because unfortunately in this generation, we had a uh, 
change of ideology and change of perspective of what the position of a woman in the world. Apparently, people are convinced that we can bring children to the world without women. So we figured, you know, we don't need the women to bring kids. Send the women to work. So the women went to work, and they woke up at 35, 38, 39, 40 years old, and they realized, oh, wait a minute. I've been working for the last 20 years. I still didn't have any kids. I still didn't have any kids. I still didn't get married. I, I, I want to have kids because I'm running out of time. Okay, but finding a husband that's willing to uh, have these kids with you is not so simple anymore. Assuming you want a normal husband and not just somebody that, uh, you know, is a roommate. So then, they, you know, they try to look for a zivug, and finding a zivug today is a, uh, harder than finding a needle in a haystack because people are crazy, people are obsessive, people are uh, materialistic and uh, consuming. It's hard to find a zivug. You know, the, uh, the uh, young guys want to get married, but they can't find girls. The old guys that uh, want to get married, but they only want young girls that don't want them. And it's a, it's, a, it's a mishmash of things. They call it a zivu crisis. I think it's a midot, an ideology crisis. The point being is that a woman comes to a point where she gets to 38, 39, 40 years old, and she's concerned that she hasn't found a zivu yet, so she asks me, should I freeze my eggs? Why? Because I'm afraid I won't find anybody to have, to, to, to have a baby with. Now, you can freeze, you cannot freeze, you can put antifreeze, you can do whatever you want. But in reality, that is anxiety caused by problems that you don't have. Bless you. That is anxiety. You're worried you're not going to have kids. Why? Because you didn't have a husband yet. Why? Because you made certain decisions. Right? Okay, fine. Why? Because you listen to people. Instead of to listen to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay, fine. Let's try to change strategy. Let's listen to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. See how things change. Now you're going to start looking for a husband? Yes. Okay, good. So that's already good. Now you're going to do mitzvot? Yes. Okay, that's already. We're already at uh, two strikes. This is very good. We're going in the right direction. Yeah, but what about the, uh, you know, what about the husband? Hold on a second. You listen to Hashem? Yes. Hashem says, if you follow his Torah, he's going to miss a big zibugim. He's going to bring you somebody. Yeah, but what about the kids? I'm getting old. I'm 40 years old. Old according to who? The same people that gave you the advice not to get married 20 years ago? Obviously, their advice is flawed to begin with. Obviously, their advice is flawed to begin with. Why? Because they depend on nature. Paro depended on nature. That's why Paro lost. The Shneluchot Abrit says that if you notice in the Pesach story that you're going to read soon, you're going to go over the Makot, the plagues. Each one, trach, destroys Egypt a little bit more. Paro pretends that he's scared, he doesn't want it. Please, 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 I'm sorry. Stop this plague. But he doesn't do his end of the bargain. And there's another plague and another plague until we get to Barad, until we get to the plague where there's hail. Hail. That's bringing hell to earth. That the Midrash Mi'am Lo'ez says that when Hashem stopped it, when Hashem stopped the hell, He stopped it in midair. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu was talking to, to Paro. Paro was crying, please, please stop this hell that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, ice with lava inside it. Only hitting the Egyptians that weren't scared of Hashem. Stop this. Please, stop this lava everywhere. There's a uh, volcano in every house. Stop it. I'm sorry. Chatanu. We, we made sins against Hashem. We're a shayin. We have to do tshuva. Mama, she did, brother. He did tshuva. So Moshe Rabbeinu screams to Hashem. Hashem stops the hell on the spot. Not, listen, Moshe, let what I dropped... Let it hit the floor. I just won't drop anymore. 
I won't drop anymore. Let it stop. Meaning after whatever is already in air already, 30,000 feet in the air, 20,000, 25,000, 15,000, 500 feet. It's about to hit the floor. Let the one that's about to hit the floor, let it hit the floor. After everything hits the floor, then we're finished. Why? Because to now, why? I'm going to bring everything back up. This is not hard for Hashem. Moshe Rabbeinu prays. Hashem stops the hail on the spot. He brings back the hail back into the atmosphere. And it's been standing there ever since. It, part of it was used with one of the wars the Midrash Me'am Lois says that Yeshua ben Nun had. But the majority of it is still there waiting. For what? Gogu Magog. Now, Oh, got the point, right? So how come he went back again? How come he didn't let Israel go? How come? How come he didn't let Israel go? His heart was hardened. Heart was hardened. Mm-hmm. The Shnei says, we have a very interesting halacha that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, this month is your Rosh Chodesh. Which month is he talking about? Tishrei? No. Nisan. But Nisan is not Rosh Chodesh. Nisan is not Rosh Chodesh. Tishrei is Rosh Chodesh, meaning it's the first month of the year. Rosh Shana is Tishrei. But Hashem says the first Rosh Chodesh, Nisan. As if it's the beginning of the year. But it's not the beginning of the year, though. But it's says, for you, Moshe, is the beginning. Why? Why until this day, the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah says that there's four New Year's. There are four New Year's during the year for Am Yisrael. One of them is Nisan. Why? Why is Nisan the New Year for Am Yisrael? Why? It says because when Pa'o, when Pa'o decided that uh, he doesn't want to listen to Moshe anymore, this deal that they had, that he stopped the plague of uh, all this hail and everything. He promised them he's going to free them, and he decided he reneged on a deal. Why did he renege on a deal? Because then his people, his necromancers, told him, listen, listen, Paro, before you free millions of people, think about this. Who's our God? He says, the, the, the goat, little goat with the beard, free beard. Ma says, why does Hashem give the, the, the goat a beard? To show you the beard's for free. <laughs> so now, the goat is our God. He goes, oh, this month, oh, this month is the month of the goat. Arius, that's our sign. Our God is more powerful this month. Our God is more powerful this month, so this month we can beat Moshe Rabbeinu. Paro says, Chazaku Baruch. Moshe, no deal. No deal, Moshe. Why not? Why no deal? Ah, I don't need you. I got my God. This month, I got the areas. This God is the most powerful God. So, Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, this month is your new year. Is your new Rosh Chodesh. Yours, but not his. Yours, Am Yisrael, is where the power is going to be. Not their power. Ashkadosh Baruch Hu specifically made this the month. Why? To show us 3,300 years later that Mazal is only for the Goim. It's Am Yisrael above the Mazal. Am Yisrael does not have to depend on fortunes. Does not have to depend on fortunes. Akadosh Baruch Hu wanted to tell you, listen, if I want something to happen for my children, I don't need it to happen at a specific time of the year. I don't need it to happen at a specific age. I don't need my children to depend on science and biology and Scientology and thisology and all types of allergies. My children are above nature. Why? I'm the one that's controlling it. I'm at the wheel. 
So who worries about having kids at a certain age? People that don't have emunah in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Who worries about not having parnasah? People that have no emunah in Bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Who worries about not getting married? Who worries about anything? Someone that has a deficiency in their emunah in Bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah, what if I can't find a job? Well, maybe the bigger problem is that you should find God first. Why? Because the job is the least of your problems. The problem is you don't believe in God. That's the problem. You believe that God needs your help to find a job. That's your problem, really. It's not the job. The job, easy. Why? Kadosh Baruch runs the world. He can start a whole new company just for you. Well, it's big on him. The problem is not the job. The problem is not the zivug. The problem is not the money. The problem is you not believing in God. Just like Paro. So either you put on a nice little uniform like the Egyptians, or get yourself together and start having some emuna. This Rabotai Karim is a reminder, a reminder that all of the anxiety we have is simply because we do not believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We don't. We're all liars. We're all fakers. Some more, some less. How do you get emuna? How do you get bitachon? You pass the tests. You pass the tests. First test, stop worrying about stuff that's not a problem currently. It may be a problem in the future, but it's not a problem today. Don't plan for retirement. Don't plan for the future ancestors as far as your money and your IRA accounts, your insurance accounts, you know, buying uh, people's, you know, love this life insurance. We used to have a life insurance business. By the way, it should call death insurance. Why? Because the only time you get the money is if you die. And that's only 50-50. Why they call life insurance? You're never going to get the money while you're alive. Death insurance should be called, but it's not marketable. You tell people, by the way, sir, when you die, when you die, your family's going to get a bunch of money. You're not going to be able to enjoy a penny out of it. And you're going to pay for the whole thing. <laughs> you're going to pay for the whole thing, but they're going to get the money. What a business. People buy all this insurance because they figure that this insurance is going to protect their family. Not a Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to protect their family. Insurance is going to protect their family. I'm not saying not to buy insurance, but if you really think that your family, all they have to, to, to rely on is this insurance, you have a very serious problem that no insurance in the world can fix it. You have no emunah in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the first things first, Rabotai Karim, stop worrying about problems that don't exist yet. Someone came to Rav Kanievsky. I told him, Kvod Rav, I need some advice. I'm about to retire in a few months and I have $250,000 in my pension. And I was thinking, I'm going to take it out in one lump sum. I'm going to buy a house at this particular area in Eretz Yisrael. What does the Rav think? It's a perfectly simple question. You would think, yes or no, it's the only options. No, that's not the only options. Rav Kanievsky says to him, come back to me when you actually have the money. In your hands. The poor guy, you don't know how they... Rav Kanievsky is not uh, sitting with people, having lunch with them for three hours. That's not common. So that was the end of the meeting. So the guy now for the next three months, he is doing all types of tshuva. Why? He's like, why is Rav Kanievsky? The Gdola Do, Sarah Torah, giant of giants, tell me, come to me. When you actually have the money in your hand, as he see through his Ruach HaKodesh that I'm never going to get the money, that in reality it's all Ponzi scheme, that in reality we're going to lose the money a day before I retire, that in reality I'm going to die before I, I'm never going to see it, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Like, poor guy, Miskin, three months, he is doing all types of tikkunim. Why? He has no idea what's going on. Why the Gdola Do, the biggest rabbi in the world, is telling me, come to me only when you have the money in your hands. Is he implying I'm not going to have it in my hands? Maybe I'm not going to have hands. 
as you would know it three months later on the clock company says bye bye writes him a check here's your pension check enjoy your life sir he's relieved he runs to love Kanievsky. I got the money I got the money I got the money okay okay got the money. No, okay. so should I buy it what the house oh yeah you should buy it that's it yeah buy the house nothing else no just buy the house what the problem what, what do you want what do you want Hidush about it why he says why didn't Kvod Arav tell me to buy the house three months ago he says because three months ago it wasn't a realistic question I didn't have the siyat dishmaya to tell you yes or no. I didn't. Hakadosh Baruch Hu didn't tell me three months in advance. That's prophecy. I don't have prophecy. You ask now, Hashem is because it's a real problem now. It's a real issue now. It's a real question now. Hashem wants to help you through me. So I pray. I learn. I do everything. You ask me a question, Akadosh Baruch Hu will give me the answer. When? When the problem actually exists. Until then, it's just imaginary anxiety. If a person really applies what we just said over the last few minutes in their life, life becomes peaches. Mamash, life becomes just amazing. Why? You live without worries until it's necessary to worry and even then if you have enough emunah during the other times where you're not just suffering quietly when there's really things that are problems you know that the same akadosh Baruch Hu that helped you all these other times will help you today also this rabotai karim is one of the foundations one of the foundational principles that Hashem gifted to us in order to enjoy this world this world which means that when a person does not enjoy this world because he's constantly anxious about stuff that hasn't happened yet it's his fault he is choosing to suffer I don't even think it's counted as kaparat avonot in Shemaim like the stress that he has or she has about things that haven't happened I'm not really sure if it counts as kaparat avonot at all it may count a little bit but not like big why because it's a problem that you're inventing it's not a problem that Hashem actually gave you the problem is you don't have emunah in Hashem that's not Hashem's fault So now we have to know that who is this Hashem? We've been talking about him for the last few years. And this Mishnah in Avot is going to tell us a little bit about Hashem. To the extent of how he bought five things. in order to utilize them in this world in this creation for you to connect to him דכתיב אדוני קנני ראשית דרכו קדם מפעליו מאז שמיים וארץ מניין דכתיב כה אמר אדוני השמיים כיסי והארץ אדום רגלי איזה בית אשר תבנו לי ואיזה מקום מנוחתי ואומר מה רבו מעשיך אדוני כולם בחוכמה עשית מלא ארץ קנייניך אברהם מניין דכתיב ואברכהו ויומר ברוך אברהם לאל עליון קונה שמיים וארץ ישראל מניין דכתיב עד יעבור עמך אדוני עד יעבור עם זו קנית ואומר לקדושים אשר בארץ אמה ואדירי כל חפצי בם 
בית המקדש מנין, תכתיב מכון לשבטך פעלת אדוני, מקדש אדוני כוננו ידיך, ואומר ויביאם אל גבול קדשו, הר זה קנתה ימינו. As you can see, it's a long Mishnah with a handful of psukim from the Torah that they're using again like in the previous Mishnayot that we had uh, in this uh, chapter as the sources for the Mishnah, which in essence means it's like a partial teachings from the sages, and the rest of it is literally like reading a few paragraphs from the Torah itself. Five possessions did the Holy One, blessed is He, acquire for himself in his world. And they are the Torah, one possession. Heaven and earth, one possession. Avram, one possession. Israel, one possession. The Holy Temple, one possession. And where do we know about the, the Torah? Where do we know this about Torah, that it's one of his possessions? One of the sources is Proverbs 8.22. It's written, God acquired me, meaning the Torah is speaking. God acquired me at the beginning of his way, before his works in time of yore. In essence, before creation. 974 generations before he created the world, he acquired me. From where do we know about the heaven and earth, that Hashem acquired the heaven and the earth? The prophet Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1. So says God, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house can you build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Also in Psalm 104, 24, How abundant are your works, God, with wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. And where do we know about Avraham, that Avraham is one of the possessions? Genesis 14.19, Bereshit 14.19 says, And he blessed him and said, Blessed is Avram of God the Most High, who acquired heaven and earth. And where do we know about the people of Israel, that they are one of his possessions? Exodus 15.16, Until your people passes through God, until it passes through this people you acquired. And also it says in Psalm 16, 3, But for the holy ones who are in the earth, and for the mighty, all my desires are due to them. And from where do we know about the holy temple, the Bet HaMikdash, that it's one of Hashem's possessions? In Exodus 15, 17, already talks about it. Your dwelling place which you, God, have made, the sanctuary, my Lord, that your hands established. And also, and he brought them to a sacred boundary, to this mountain which his right hand acquired. So far, this sounds like one big parable that's hard to understand. Now, we're going to explain Bezat Hashem over a little, maybe a year or two, what Chazal is trying to tell us here. What are these five possessions? What do they mean? What does this message sound like a cryptic message of some kind? What are we actually saying here? What do we get from here? How does this have to do with bitachon? What does this have to do with emunah and Hashem? What does it have to do with anything in our day-to-day -day life in 5779 or 2019 in the year of the Christians? So, Chazal here says that Hashem has, in essence, five possessions, five creations, that He designated these special five creations in order to bring glory to His name. These are five different creations that, in essence, that without them, the world simply could not exist. They were par each one of them are paramount for the world to exist. Not just for when the time they existed, but in essence, eternity. Five things. More so, these five things are 
something that's accessible to people. They were here at some point, which HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to tell us, since I am inaccessible, you can't touch me, can't feel me, and for the most part, 99.99999% of all of mankind that ever existed, the billions upon billions and billions and billions of billions that have existed, the reality is the vast majority of them never heard a single word from Hashem. He doesn't talk to everybody. You have to be a prophet for that. So, Akadosh Baruch Hu says, these five creations are a means for which you can acquire in order to develop a relationship with me. Meaning, if you want a relationship with me, you have to have at least a connection to one of them. Without a connection to even a single one, you and me, disconnected. Zero. You may say you believe in God, but it's a different God, it's not me. It's like saying to a woman, listen, I believe we're married. She's like, yeah, you can believe whatever you want. I have a different husband and six other kids. I have no idea what you're talking about. Even legally, even legally, you don't have a document. You can believe what you want. But if you get close to the house, I'm calling the cops. <laughs> Why? Because you believe. Believe means nothing. Believe means nothing. What's the proof? You have proof? You have evidence? You have documents? In order for a person to have a connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he has to have a connection to these five tools, to these five creations, these five possessions. First one that's mentioned is Torah. Torah is one of his possessions. Why is the Torah the first possession that's being mentioned? Because the Torah is the master plan for all of creation and the guide for man to generate honor for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In essence, it's not essential saying it's essential to the world is an understatement why because aside from the fact that the only way that a person can achieve closeness to god is through the torah it's impossible to be holy without torah impossible impossible to be righteous without the torah impossible jew or gentile impossible why because the Torah is the instruction set of what Hashem wants from you. Meaning that if you do not know the Torah, you're not going to follow it. If you don't follow it, that means that you're violating all of His instructions of how to connect to Him. It's like a woman says to you, listen, you want to get married? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, no problem. I'm willing to marry you. I just have five things I want from you. Okay, okay, just give me the list. I'll look at it later. Okay. Look at it later. You take it, crunch it up, throw it in the garbage. Guess what? She's not going to marry you. Why? Because she sees that on the second date, you didn't even fulfill one of the requests she had. What was her request? Pick her up at the house. Pick her up at the house. Instead, you didn't pick her up at the house. Why? You called her at 8 o'clock and said, listen, can you come pick me up? Can you come pick me up? Request number two. Request number two. Send her a message during the day if the date's on or not. Guess what? You didn't send a message. You didn't send a message. That was requirement number two. Send a message. You didn't send a message. You just figured it must be. Why? What else is she going to do without me? What else is God going to do without me? He needs my mitzvot. That's our attitude also. Hashem needs my mitzvot. I'm doing him a favor when I pray. I'm doing him a favor when I go to Shu. People are like doing Hashem a favor when they do something. So guess what? You didn't call, you didn't text her, nothing. You failed requirement number two. And so on and so forth, Rabotai. A person needs to look at the instructions. You don't look at the instructions. There's no connection. 
But here the Chazal uses a verse, a verse from the Torah to prove the case. And the verse is in Proverbs 8.22 where Shlomo Melech writes in the name of the Torah, meaning the Torah is speaking here, saying, God acquired me, meaning the Torah, at the beginning of his way, before his works in time of yore. What does that mean, God acquired me, before? So the Gemara in Masechet Chagigah says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took a look and there was nothing except himself. And he decided that in order for him to continue, he wanted to create something. And what is that? He wanted to create something that he can give good to. Because the definition of good is something that generates good. You can't just say I'm a good person, but you only help yourself. You can't say I'm very kind to people. To who? Show me some examples. No, nobody yet, but if somebody came to me, I definitely helped them. I definitely helped them. But yeah, but who did you help in your life? You're 35 years old, 40 years old. Who have you helped so far? One person, two people, not so many. You're a very kind person. Don't give me the whole list. Just show me like one recent, like in the last year, who would you help? No, nobody in the last year. Okay, fine. Well, you probably, last year, it's a tough year last year, recession. Two years, two years. Who would you help in the last two years? No, no, not so much. Last two years, I don't have anybody. Can't come up with anybody. Hey, you know what? Last two years, it's a crisis. Last 10 years, the last decade of your life, 30% of your life, who have you helped? Who have you contributed to? Where have you volunteered your time? Because money, of course, money is almost like uh, people looking like it's God. So forget about money. Your time, have you contributed your time to volunteer to help society? Or even your mother, or your father, or your brother. Where have you helped somebody? Ah, 10 years, that's a, that's a tough question. It's a tough question. You actually, you actually want an answer for that one? So why do you call yourself kind? Why do you call yourself helpful? What have you done for society that makes you good? Because you think you're good. Because you have an opinion about yourself that's biased. In order to be good, you have to do good. For other people, without payment. If you're doing it only with payment, that's not called good. That's called business. If the only time you give somebody something is if they pay you, that's just simply called customer service. That's it. It's not called good. You may have a nice smile when you're doing business, but that doesn't make you good. Just makes you a good businessman. Nice customer service. Allah, the next time we do a... Uh, thank you. Next time we do a uh, review on your company, we'll check mark. Nice employees. Doesn't make you good. Good means you do for free. Good you means that you are making a sacrifice. That you could technically be doing something else more beneficial financially more beneficial otherwise but you decide to do this why for the benefit of others that's what good means if you do not contribute your time to other people or the only people that you contribute time to are people you have to contribute time to like for example your children being good to your children doesn't automatically make you good it's good you're good to your children because then we have to call uh, the government on you. But uh, you have to be good to them. But it doesn't necessarily make you good. Why? Because if you're only good to your children, then eventually those children are going to grow up and they're going to move. So who are you going to be good to at that point? No one? Yourself? So your, your climatic point in life is to be selfish for yourself? To do nothing? What is that, graduation party? Everybody left the house? 
So a person needs to know. You have to do good for the sake of good. Why? Because that is a way of emulating a Kadosh Baruch Hu. If you want a connection with Him, you have to emulate Him. You have to be like Him in the ways that you can be. So Hashem wanted to create a world because He is good. He is the ultimate good. Not only is He giving, He never gets anything in return. All we do is for our own benefit. Even learning Torah, even fulfilling mitzvot, even sanctifying His name. It's for our own good. Because He is perfect with or without us. We can never add to Him, we can never subtract from Him. So, the Torah says that she was created as part of that creation. When? Before mankind. Before the world. As Zohar Kadosh says, Hashem istakel be'oraita ubara alma. He looked at the Torah, oraita, and he created the world. Meaning, he looked at the Torah as a blueprint. The Torah and all of its rules and all of its instructions, that is the instructions for life, instructions for the world, instructions for the universe, instructions for eternity. He looked at those instructions and based on those instructions, he created the creation that you see as physicality today. So for example, there is a mitzvah of shluch haken. Shluch haken is when you're commanded to, if you see a, a bird in a nest and uh, she has eggs in there, shui, if it's a kosher bird, of course, not if it's an eagle or some non-kosher bird, then it's not a mitzvah. But if it's a kosher bird, like a dove or something like that, you see it, you shoo away the mom and take the eggs. Now this may sound vicious to some people, but the Gemara says that anyone that says that you're supposed to uh, think of this mitzvah because, uh, uh, you know, Hashem wants to teach you mercy. You should be quiet. Don't give any more chidushim. Why? That's not the reason for shloch again. What's the reason? Hashem said so. That's it. That's the reason. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. The poor bird, her little chicklets, a little there. Hashem said so. That's the reason. That's the actual reason. That's actually the reason for all the mitzvot. That's the next Mishnah, by the way. Now, that's the reality. There's a mitzvah like that. So Hashem said, oh, there's a mitzvah of shloch again. So I have to create birds. So I created birds. And he created a bird with a physical makeup that creates eggs. Because if the, if, if the bird didn't create eggs, if it gave birth like a human being, if it gave birth like an elephant, like a mammal, guess what? There's no mitzvah of shloch again. Why? There's no eggs. You need the eggs and the bird, not just the, one without the other. One without the other doesn't work. He made a mitzvah of kosher. Kosher birds, kosher animals, and so on. Oh, so I have to make, if everything is eatable, then there's no mitzvah of kosher. Why? Because you can't distinguish. So you had to make kosher and non-kosher. With specific signs. If it chews its cud and has split hooves, then it's a kosher animal. If it doesn't have both of those signs, it's not a kosher animal. There are four animals that are mentioned in the Torah that only have one sign. One of them is the pig. One of them is the pig. And he has the split hooves, but he doesn't chew his cud. Why? What's this to teach us? What's this to teach us? Teach us that the Yetzirah is just like the pig. He shows off to you, look, look, I'm kosher. Look, I'm kosher. No, 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 I'm kosher. Come, come. Come, come. Ba bacon, egg, and cheese. Come. Come, McDonald's. Come. I'm kosher. Look, split hooves. I'm kosher. Come, no. It's just a coffee from McDonald's. What, there's pig and coffee? It's just a uh, tuna sandwich from Subway. When was the last time you ate a shark and a tuna sandwich? No, come on, just a tuna sandwich from Subway. 
It's just the donuts from Dunkin' Donuts. Why? You're eating where there's pig inside the donuts? No, what's the big deal? Come on, kosher. I have one sign. That's the Yetzirah. Yetzirah doesn't come to you open. Hey, listen, I'm the ISIS. I'm Daesh. I'm here to kill you. No. Yetzirah comes to you and says, listen, I'm the rabbi. Look at my beard. I'm the rabbi. Look at my hat. Look at my suit. The Yetzirah comes to you like a rabbi. He doesn't come to you like uh, Mustafa. That's how the Yetzirah comes. Because if he came to you like Mustafa, if he came to you like the Pope, only Malach Hamirvis falls for stuff like this. The rest of mankind realizes it's a trap. The rest of mankind realizes it's a trap. But sometimes you want to fall into the trap. Because you like the Yetzirah. Because you really want to eat pig. You're just looking for an excuse. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu created a Torah with an instruction set. And he looked at the instructions. And the instructions said kosher animals. And the instructions said Mishluch HaKen. And the instructions said that there's going to have to be a time where a man has to become a man. A Jewish man has to become a Jewish man. Automatically, all men are thinking, yeah, yeah, Brit Milah. No, that should make you a Jew. I said Jewish man. When does a Jewish man become a Jewish man? When? Bar Mitzvah, wrong. That's a 13-year-old boy that hopes that one day he's going to become uh, married. When does a Jewish man become a man? When? 20 years old? Yeah. Why? I forgot the reason why. It's not the reason. Oh, no, you don't get punished for your sins until you're 20. You get punished for the sins before 20. It's not true. Just you don't get punished for most sins in your life, during your life for sins before 20 years old. But you do get punished for wasting seed, even if you did it at 10 years old. So the sin that's relevant to most people, you get punished for in this world. It's just that the other sins you don't get punished for in this world. So it's not 20 years old anyway, and it has nothing to do with that topic. No, no. When does when a man become a man? When? Get married. His wife doesn't think he's a man so much sometimes. His wife says, well, no, be a man, change some diapers. <laughs> no, no, you're getting, you're getting closer, though. Be actually, you're getting closer. Baruch Atah Adonai, Elohim Menecha Olam, Shaykon Yom Edvorom. When? And she said, what? She said, learning Torah? What is he going to do with this Torah? He learned Torah at 13 years old also. Practice, okay, no. So combine the two answers. Rabotai Yekarim, Rabotai Yekarim, a man becomes a man, a Jewish man. When? When his wife gives birth, and now he has to love her more, not less, more than he did a minute before she gave birth. Why? Because now he can't even touch her finger for the next two, three months. That's when you become a man. When you can protect your breed as well as love and show affection to your wife without even touching her finger. That's when you become a man. If you need to touch your wife in order to show her love, you're not a man, you're a beast. If you need certain things in order to show affection that's not love my friends it's lust you want to become a man you want to become a jewish man you not only have to fulfill the mitzvah pool boo you have to fulfill the mitzvah of tarata mishpacha you have to fulfill the mitzvah of protecting your breed and you have to fulfill all of them at the same time that's not just the Jewish man. That's Superman. <laughs> Why? 
Okay, so you could show your wife you love her. Yeah, yeah, honey, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. But why? In reality, he can't wait for her to go to sleep. Why? Because he wants to watch uh, all the garbage on TV. That's not love. Or, nothing. He decides, you know what? This Tarat uh, Mishpacha is not for us. He hugs her and kisses her and everything else. Like, everything is normal. Why? Listen, honey, if I can't hug you, I can't kiss you, I can't be in the same bed all the time, I, can't, I have to find a second wife while you're pregnant. I have to find a second wife. Well, I'm a man after all. No, my friend, you're not a man. You're a beast. What separates Am Yisrael from the rest of the nations is that we have mitzvot that tell us when and how and who and why for everything. A person that wants to be a man has to protect their breed. But at the same time, not become some recluse, puts himself in some uh, cave and says, Honey, listen, I'm going to Israel for six months to learn in the yeshiva. Call me when I'm able to like, come home. That's not a man. That's a person that runs away from his problems. That's a person that's running away from challenge. And guess what? He'll fail over there. He'll fail over there. The key to success in, over, in, in, in life is overcoming obstacles, not running away from them. Being like the Seuss. You know what the Seuss is? The horse. What is so special about the horse? The horse runs to the battle, not away from it. You run to the obstacle. Why? I'm going to overcome it. Now run away from it. Don't pretend there's no problem. Deal with the problem, face it, and fix it. Now I can tell you the only reason why I'm very confident about this subject, maybe more than others, because Baruch Hashem had plenty of problems in my life which forced me to deal with them. But of course, there were times that you don't want to deal with them. You want to run away from them. But that's when you decide whether you're a man or a little boy. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote this Torah. He wrote this Torah, Rabotai, for you to become a man. For you to become a woman. When does a woman become a woman? Not just when she's uh, giving children, because even a 12, 13-year-old can give children. That doesn't make her a woman. When she becomes an Eshet Chayil. Eshet Chayil. What's an Eshet Chayil? Eshet Chayil is the one that brings you tea if you didn't ask. If you didn't ask, she brings you tea. She brings you coffee. She brings you dinner. That's Eshet Chayil. But if you have to ask... It's not Eshet Chayil. It's a waitress. It's a waitress. You married a waitress. Honey, I'm hungry. Oh, okay, I'll make you something to eat, Kapara. Oh, you know how? You know what? I'll just order. Oh, okay, that's better for me. It's better for me. Order, order. Better. That's not, that's a waitress. That's not a... Eshet Chayil is someone that does the things that a husband desires without him asking. Why? Because she knows her husband. But how can an Eshet Chayil become Eshet Chayil? If a husband is the man. If he's the man, if he's a Jewish man, if he does everything I just said, she'll become an Eshet Chayil. But if he's a little boy, if he's a psychopath, if he's a loser, guess what? She cannot become an Eshet Chayil. Why? It's not worth it. In this generation, it's business. Relationships are business. You give me, I give you. You give me, I give you. It's not supposed to be that way. But if you want to have a successful marriage, you have to look at things this way. I have to do everything possible to fulfill my role. With or without her doing it. Whether she becomes Eshet Chayel or not is irrelevant. I'm going to do my role. You worry about you. Fixing you in order to please her. 
She, if she's a normal human being, and you didn't marry Malach Hamavit, she ultimately will realize, okay, you know what? This guy is uh, Mamash Buba. This guy is amazing. She's going to reciprocate. Why? That's the way the world works. But if you're constantly going to wait for her to do in order for you to do, please do not get married. We already have enough bad people in the world. We already have enough divorces and we don't want you to, to reproduce and produce more bad stuff. You want to be Eshet Chayl? You worry about becoming Eshet Chayl. You want to be, you want her to be Eshet Chayl? You worry about being a good man. Torah also teaches that. That's why people that follow the Torah, they don't get divorced. Why? They don't need to. I don't mean people that go to synagogue. Sometimes you see birds in a synagogue. It doesn't mean that they, uh, they're they married. Sometimes they're single. I don't mean people that wear hats and have beards. Not all women have beards. They go to synagogue. I mean people that follow the Torah. I mean people that follow the Torah. Torah means from Aleph at Taf. Not just the mitzvot, but the point of the mitzvot. The Gaon Mivina says, what's the point of all the mitzvot? Fix yourself. Fix your midot. Fix your character traits. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a book which he wrote with black fire on white fire 974 generations before he created the world. And he created the world by using this book as an instruction set. As an instruction set of what to put into this world. This Tarat Mishpacha, I'll create a male and a female. Female will have a menstrual cycle. The male will desire the female with or without the menstrual cycle. If they follow the Torah, he'll know when he's allowed, he'll know when he's not allowed, and then he'll follow it. If he's going to go against the Torah, he's going to completely ignore it as if I never wrote it. That ignore may not seem like a big deal. But these are five kinyanim. These are five major possessions that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you violate them, you're disconnected from me. And that's why a husband or a wife or even a single person that touches a woman that's not his wife or even if he touches his own wife, when she's impure, it's isul karet. What's karet? Cut off. Cut off. This is special place in Gainom. On one end, horrible. Karet. On the other end, he benefits this world and the next world. Not following the Torah, he loses in both worlds. Following the Torah, he wins in both. So the Torah here says that Hashem used me because I am the reason for creation, Rashi says. It's not that mankind is the reason for creation. Mankind is here to fulfill the reason for creation. But what preceded man? Torah. Why? Because Torah is a ikal. If Am Yisrael did not want to accept the Torah, guess what? Hashem would have destroyed Am Yisrael. Why? Because the Torah is the ikar. Torah is the, is, the, is the primary thing. Not the people. Because without the people connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and sanctifying His name, they lose their right to live. Shamayim v'aretz kinayim Echad Heaven and earth one possession. Why? Why is Hashem mentioning heaven and earth? The Rambam explains 
אין יסודי התורה, הלכות יסודי התורה. This is really a must read and reread and reread and reread your whole life. The Mishneh Torah is just something that if you don't read it, you're just simply missing out on life. Not only are you not going to know what to do in life, but you're just missing out on life because it explains so many things of who, what, when, and how that if any time I open it up, it's mamash, I feel like I'm in Gan Eden. I said, Hashem, if this is so good, what do you do over there? Mamash, it's unbelievable. Why? Because it's like you had, there was a human being, flesh and blood, we think like us, 900 years ago, that wrote this for memory. I mean, you can bring all the scientists in the world, all the scientists in the world, put them in a room for 10 years, they wouldn't be able to write Mishneh Torah or anything like it. All of them. If it wasn't Ruach HaKodesh, I don't know what it was. But he explains the most sophisticated things in the world in the simplest way possible. That's the genius. And he says in Ilchot Yesodei Torah, first and foremost, the person needs to know that heaven and the earth is one of the most important things for a person to acknowledge on a constant basis. The world around him and the world above him. Why? Because that is a way that a person can acknowledge how significant the creation is. How magnificent it is. How awesome it is. Because the creation tells you a little bit about the Creator. If you saw a little watch, a little stopwatch, a little stopwatch, only has one function. Start and stop the watch, and the numbers go up. You're going to say, wow, whoever put this little stopwatch together, he must, uh, must be a smart guy, he knows how to use some uh, specific lighting, specific energy, certain uh, amount of information about a, uh, the, the motherboard of this little watch. He knows about this. He has from 1 to 10 of uh, genius. He's probably like a 2. Why? Well, he has a stopwatch. He's not a 0. He's not a monkey. He's not also a 1. That's like a regular priest. He's, he's a 2. He's better than the average. Why? Well, he made a stopwatch. You saw another guy make a computer like they did the, uh, 30 years ago. Each computer was like a uh, refrigerator. And this computer makes all types of noise. And, ah, mm, ah, mm, ah, mm. What, what's it doing? What's it doing? Oh, it's turning on. Oh, it makes so much noise. It makes more noise than me in the morning. This computer just to turn on. Okay, finally, it turned on 20 minutes later. Okay, now what? Oh, now you can type. For who? To what? No, nothing, just on the screen. What am I going to do after I type it? You can press the print button. And what happens then? It goes to print. Where? I'm not printer over there. It's the size of a house. Okay, and then what? He goes, that's it. Well, can I send this to somebody? He goes, yeah, after you print it, put it in an envelope, send it to somebody. Go to USPS in the office. It's like I could have just typed it in a typewriter that was already invented 100 years before you. He goes, yeah, but it's uh, electronic. Okay, so that guy is probably smarter than a stopwatch guy. Probably smarter, probably sophisticated, but not that much more. Why? Because uh, what does he have? A glorified typewriter. Now the next guy comes up and he says, by the way, do what you wrote on this computer. It's going to go all the way to the end of the world. You wrote it here in America, it's going to Russia, to Putin. You have email, you have internet, all types of stuff. That's different. Why? Because that means you have technology from here all the way to the end of the world. Different level, much higher. As a side note, when they told the Chafetz Chaim Alava Shalom, there's something called video where you can record something and it stores on this little tape and then you can project it on a screen. The Chafetz Chaim started crying, hysterical. 
says, they don't get it. They don't get it. What, Kodarav, what? Were you worried about movies? No. If they can record you here, that means that what it says in the Gemara, that they're going to show you your life over there, that's how it's going to happen. If they can, why did Hashem allow the camera to come to this world? Why, so you can watch movies? Has Shalom? No. So you realize if they can do it here, surely they're doing it up there. If you could see a movie of some guy that did something in the middle of the world 25 years ago, you can see it today, surely in 25 years from now, or 50 years from now, or 100 years from now, when all of us are in Shemaim, guess what? They're going to show us what we did today. Even when nobody was watching. Why? Because he's watching. All the time. His tape is always rolling. No battery. No electricity. Chafetz Chaim saw the Kedusha in the creation of the Creator. And the creation of the creation. He understood how you could look at the creation and see Hashem in it. There's a tape recorder here. There's definitely a tape recorder there. So, the Rambam says that a person needs to look at the creation very simply. And immediately you will arrive at appreciating the Creator. If he's objective. If he's looking for truth. Some people are looking at, at the world and they see things that are stupid. Like one of this famous scientists, this uh, Tyson something, relatively famous, well-spoken well Rasha. And he says, well, if there is a God, then he doesn't know what he's doing. Look how many mistakes are in creation. There is a war and there's a, uh, miscarriages and there's disease, and he starts noticing all the, you know, mentioning all the things that, you know, in essence, malfunction. Not realizing that the malfunction is part of the way that the system functions. The malfunction is necessary. The war is necessary. Disease is necessary. Bad things, necessary for creation. Necessary. Why? That's why Hashem runs the world. That's the good and bad. That's the reward and punishment. If there's no reward and punishment, there's no point of the world. And reward and punishment comes in different forms. But if a person is looking for falsehood because he's looking to justify his life, he's going to find a lot of things that he doesn't like. Those people, I can't wait. I can't wait till they meet Hashem. But before they meet him, I can't wait, I can't wait for them to be at the last moments. Why? During the last moments, everything fails. All that Dawin, all that, uh, uh, that pride that the person had, that show off that he had his whole life, all that goes to the garbage. Why? Because before a person dies, ooh, uh, he's not himself anymore. Can't control his body, stuff comes out, stuff comes in, all types of wonderful things. Go talk to the Creator now about how is his malfunctions. Malfunctions. Your whole life you were able to go to the bathroom with no problem. Now you can't for a week. Good luck, buddy. All of a sudden, all the food tastes like sand. All of a sudden, you can't see from one eye. All of a sudden, your hearing is off. Why? You've been complaining about the Creator uh, malfunctioning, right? So, okay, so you start malfunctioning. But when are you going to start appreciating the Creator? When He starts taking stuff away from you. Because you, didn't take it, you took it for granted. So the Rambam says that if you look at his Ilchot Yesodea Torah, you can get to a point of appreciating the Creator to His creation. But first and foremost, you need to know that there is rules. There are rules to the rules. What are the rules to the rules? The beginning of Ilchot Yesodea Torah which means foundation of Torah, the laws of the foundation, the laws which are the foundation of the Torah. The Rambam writes here that 
יש בכללן עשר מצוות, שש מצוות עשה וארבע מצוות לא תעשה, וזהו פרטן. They contain ten מצוות, six positive commandments, things you need to do, and four negative commandments, things you have to refrain from doing. First one, to know that there is a God. Notice he says, לידש יש שם אלוה. To know there's a God, not to believe there's a God. To know there's a God. Why is to know there's a God the mitzvah and not to believe that there's a God? This believing is kind of like just blind faith. It's not really, a, it's not really uh, it's not just your own personal belief. Like knowing there's a God means that you, it's knowledge. Let me sharpen up with your answer a little bit. The Abarbanel says the following. You cannot command somebody to believe anything. Why? Belief is a state of mind. Just, you believe it. You can't tell somebody, listen, believe that I'm over there. Why? I'm here. When you tell, I see you. I know you're here, not there. So you can tell me to believe over there. You can't tell me. To, how can you command me to believe something? I believe what I see. Can't tell somebody to believe something. But I can command you to know. Why? Because to know means that a person develops their knowledge and awareness of Hashem, develops their belief in Hashem to the extent of internalizing their belief in order to make it a part of their conscience. In essence, what this means is that this is a internal uh, internalization of your faith, internalization of your pre-existing belief, which requires effort. Belief does not require effort. You believe, you don't believe. You see, you don't see. But if I now have this belief that the lamp is over there. I now want to know that it's there, not just believe it's there. I'm going to do some research. I'm going to go check over here. I'm going to check over there. I'm going to ask some people, have you seen the lamp? Where did you see the lamp last? Over there. Oh, I'm going to check. I'm going to ask for evidence. I'm going to, it requires effort. Knowledge requires effort. That's why it's a mitzvah. You're required to know God because you're required to discover Him. How? To following His Torah. But the people that say, no, 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 I believe in God and I just have my own way, they get into trouble not just with the first mitzvah. They get into trouble with number five, which we'll get to momentarily. Number two is not to consider, not to consider the thought that there is another God aside from God. There's no other divine being. Number three, to unify God. Everything is from Him. Everything started from Him. Everything will end from Him. He is everything. He's connected to everything. There really isn't anything but Him. And He goes into extent through this Yesudah Torah. Obviously, we're not going to go through all of it or even 2% of it. But in essence... The learning of Torah allows you to understand how Hashem's hand is in everything. And the goal of a Jew is to connect a Kadosh Baruch Hu to everything in your life. To your marriage, to your day-to-day, to your parnasah, to your learning, to your success, to your failure, through everything. Connect a Kadosh Baruch Hu to everything. If you do that, you can become like Moshe Rabbeinu. What's Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu thought about God 24 hours a day. When I first heard this from my Rav years ago, I said, what do you mean he thought about God 24 hours a day? You mean like every time he did a blessing? He did a lot of blessings all day? Every two seconds, all five seconds? Every two seconds, shakol, shakol, shakol. Just do one for the whole day, No. 
Why, why, why so, so, many, so many blessings, Moshe? He says, no, not that. He thought about a Kadosh Baruch Hu 24 hours a day because he connected everything that happened in his life to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Breath came out of his lungs. He says, look, a Kadosh Baruch Hu made me lungs. These lungs function without me telling them. They just do it by themselves. I don't have to pay them. I don't have to rent them. I don't have to convince them. I don't even have to say a nice thing to them. They just do it by themselves. And then, on top of that, it goes out, and then I need more. They automatically know by themselves to bring some air back from breathing. Then he gets hungry. He wants to eat something. He didn't eat for 40 days, 40 nights. He wants a little apple. He says, look at this. Hashem gave me teeth. When was the last time you saw a rock a rock kind of come out of an ocean. Usually hard stuff doesn't come out of flesh. You have teeth that come out of meat. Meat doesn't usually produce hard stuff. And where is this, where is this hard stuff? It's exactly the place it's supposed to be. Why? If your molars, if your big teeth, were instead of being in the back of your mouth, were in the front of your mouth, guess what? You could be like one of those, uh, one of those uh, sheep that Paro, Paro liked. Why? Because they eat like this, with their face in the air. Why? Because if, you, if your molars were over here, you'd have to chew here, and all the food would come out of your mouth and fall on the floor. So he's enjoying Hashem while he's chewing an apple. And he's thinking to himself, wait a minute, where does apple come from? Where does apple come from? 99% of the apple is water. 99% of it is water. It is a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of something. Turn into this water, to this delicious apple. Now you would think, oh, so surely all apples taste the same. They're all 99% water. No. Not only that, take another vegetable. Take a, a cucumber. Tastes completely different. Take an orange, completely different. How did all this happen? Well, there's like a seed. A seed that came into the ground, completely got demolished and destroyed, but somehow became a tree. And the tree yielded apples. So this seed that got destroyed, that got ruined, had to get ruined, had to get destroyed in order to create something really, really hard that seemed like, oh, there's not, you can't do anything with this tree. This tree, oh, wow. The this, this seed went really bad. It created something hard, ugly, it made this, what? Next thing you know, you got these beautiful apples. All of them taste different. All of them look different. So Moshe Rabbeinu is enjoying his teeth, the apple, the tree, the seed, all of creation. What? He's constantly connecting everything to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you pay attention, simply pay attention to the world around you, you can be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Anybody can do this. Why? That's how you were created. This is inside your DNA. Simply anything you look at, think about Hashem. How did this come to be? Oh, this, this, this plastic cup over here. Where does plastic come from? Anybody know? Oil. Where does oil come from? The world. Where did, where, how do they find it? It's for free. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has it in the world. How much supply? As much as Hashem wants. You know, they'll tell you on the news, there's a shortage of oil, there's a, a surplus of oil. Why? Because they manipulate the prices. But in reality, you're not running out of oil. You're not running out of water. Why? Because Hashem runs the world. All the people that worry about, uh, you know, the uh, global warming or all this other nonsense, that's simply atheism. That's justifying atheism. That's all it is. A person looks at the creation and he'll see the Creator. He'll get to know the Creator and appreciate Him. But that requires mitzvah number three, which is unifying you. Number four is to love Hashem. Loving Hashem becomes much easier once you're connecting to Him constantly. Bottle of water, you connect to Hashem. The one thing that you need to survive, the world happens to have a surplus of. 72% of the world is water. The one thing we need in order to survive, we have a surplus of. The stuff we don't need goes extinct. Bengal tigers, we don't really need so much. So there's only 3,000 left in the world. Certain types of wolves, we don't really need them. So they're extinct. 
certain types of, uh, you know, beings, we don't need them. Gone. If we need them, we have a surplus. We don't need them, they're gone. Yes, yeah, so what about uh, joining, uh, what's her name, that uh, wants to fund the monkeys in, uh, in uh, Helen DeGeneres? Why don't we, why don't we donate to Helen DeGeneres in uh, a few million dollars, like Ashton Kutcher donated $4 million. Moron. To go save some monkeys in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a mountain. With $4 million, you could save the country instead of the monkey, the people. The people you can save. No, no, no. Forget the people. We have plenty of people. We have 8 billion people in the world. We need to save monkeys now. People spend billions of dollars saving monkeys and butterflies and wolves and horses and weird-looking types of bugs and all types of nonsense. But you tell people, listen, why don't you save a neshama? Why don't you save a soul? There's a Jewish guy. He doesn't know he's Jewish. He's a Jewish guy. He's intermarried. He's a Jewish girl. She doesn't have a house to live in. It's all types of... Why don't you save the neshamot? Why don't you get them to do what a, a kadosh baruch who wants? Okay, I'll... I'll, I'll hey, dollar eighty. It's uh, ten dollars. Yeah, but you donated five hundred dollars for the horse, though. Because, yeah, the horse is expensive. Horse is expensive. A lot of time told me one time he took his kids to the zoo. To the zoo in Israel. He says... And he happened to be there at the time when? When they were feeding the tiger. He says, I was looking at the tiger and I says, Alvai, they would feed the Avrechim, the Bnei Torah, that the only reason the world exists is because of them, like they feed this tiger. The tiger is getting two giant steaks. Fresh, and that's not frozen. What do you think he's going to eat frozen? You eat frozen. <laughs> Fresh, just killed. Freshly killed. Nice juicy steaks. No ketchup though. Avrechim? Chicken without chicken soup without a chicken. You have the broth. The Bnei Torah that are running in this world. The only reason Hashem lets this world exist is for them. Like the Gemara says, the whole world gets panasa because of Hanin Abni. And Hanin Abni eats Cheruvim, eats Caribs. The schut of the entire world, Hashem says, the entire world eats because of Hanina, my son, because of his Torah. But he himself, what are they feeding him? Caribs, nothing. The Bnei Torah, they are learning Torah, finishing the Shas, Shuchan Aruch, Poskim, Sadiqim, learning, doing everything. What are they eating? Barely eating. But the only reason why we're all alive is them. Only reason why we're all alive is because of Bnei Torah. People that teach Torah, people that learn Torah, people that fulfill the Torah. That's why we're alive. But the people that have the Torah, Shem Yachem, some of them don't have food to eat. That's why this year I didn't even ask for money. Usually we do Kibcha de Pischa, where we try to collect money for people to, to donate to Avrachim that we know. This year we didn't even do it. You know why? I don't want to be let down anymore. We just gave the money anyway. Anyone that donates, donates. Don't donate, don't donate. We just gave. We know they need it. If people want to donate, if Hashem wants it, I'll send it to us one way or the other. I'm tired of making special drives for this, special drive for that. People that want to donate, donate. Anyone who wants to know what we do with our money, you just simply ask. Baruch Hashem, we help a lot of Avachim in Eretz Yisrael. We help poor people, public CDs, books. Baruch Hashem, we give out maybe a few thousand dollars worth of CDs just today. Kiruv packages. I think, I think we sent out maybe, uh, I don't know, eight, nine, ten Kiruv packages for free today. Every day, thousands of dollars somehow is, uh, leaves the doors. I have no idea how it's all being paid for. A much miracle. But the reality is, it has to be done. It has to be done. Why? Because we need more Jews. So to love Hashem is very simple. How? Look at His creation. Look at what you have. Look how functional your body is. Look how functional your life is. Just take one thing, one thing that you rely on and remove it from your life for a day. See how you feel. 
Like for example, a few weeks ago, we had, we had a shoe. And it was on Sunday. And I told you guys to have a toothache during the shoe, right? Now, before the toothache, there wasn't a toothache. So what? So what happens? When you don't have a toothache, you, you don't think about, you know what? Baruch Hashem, I don't have a toothache. You don't think like that. No one thinks like that. No one thinks, Baruch Hashem, I don't have a toothache. No, you're just thinking, this is the way it's supposed to be. When do you appreciate the teeth? When you have a toothache. You have a toothache, especially during a shiul, it's very special. It was so special, I had to have a surgery the next day. Very special. Surgery, double tooth, ooh, what? Made me appreciate the teeth, but also made me see what Gainom looks like for a day. That's, by the way, anyone that wants to know personal, first-hand lesson of what Gainom looks like, have a few root canals at the same time. And imagine it without the, uh, the sedative. Imagine a root canal without the, the, the few needles they give you. Imagine that. Number five, to fear him. Yesodeh Torah. Foundation of Torah. Fear Hashem. Love Hashem, but fear Hashem also. Rabbi Yisraeli Salan says, fear of Hashem is unnatural. Unnatural. Why? He created you in a way where you will fear everything else. The bugs, the weather, the panasa problems, the anxiety, everything else except Him. Why? Because if you fear Him, you won't sin. And if you don't sin, there's no point for you to be in this world. So how do we get this fear of Hashem? How do we become tzaddikim? You have to acquire it. What does this remind you of? Knowledge of Hashem. Just like you have to acquire knowledge of Hashem, you have to acquire fear of Hashem. Now, the problem is that some people have superficial fake fear. What is a superficial fake fear? They're afraid of Hashem taking their money. They're afraid of Hashem not letting them find a zivug or something. They're afraid of Hashem doing something bad to them. They're afraid of punishment purely. We talk about punishment a lot because it's a necessary part of the Torah. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Zohar Kadosh that if that's all you have, it's no good. It's no good to just have that. Why is no good? Why is it not good to just be afraid of Hashem punishment? Because in reality, when a person is afraid of punishment only and doesn't get to a point of loving Hashem by seeing the creation, what ends up happening is the person confuses loving Hashem, uh, confuses fearing Hashem and loving himself. How? Only reason he's afraid of Hashem is because he doesn't want Hashem to take his stuff. So in reality, it's not that he's afraid of Hashem. It's that he likes his stuff. He likes his stuff. He likes his cars. He doesn't want Hashem to take it away. He likes his house and his business and his bank account. So he doesn't want to take it away. So it has nothing to do with being afraid of Hashem. It's just that he loves his own stuff. He loves himself. But Hashem, he doesn't love so much. He just likes the stuff Hashem gives him. That's why the lowest level of connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is being afraid of just punishment alone. Being afraid of punishment alone is not a place to stay at. It's a place to start at, but not to stay there. You're supposed to raise up a level, go up a level. Next, number six, is sanctifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. The Gemara says in Masechet Chaya that a person that does not find a way to sanctify Hashem's name, simply there's no reason for them to exist. Why? Because the whole point of creation is for you to sanctify Hashem's name. How do you sanctify Hashem's name? By publicizing it. How do you publicize Hashem's name? What if you just print a bunch of books 
and put them in your garage. Is that sanctifying Hashem's name? No. You print a bunch of CDs, a million CDs, but you put them in a garage, in a warehouse. Is that sanctifying His name? No. How do you sanctify Hashem's name? Taking those books, taking those CDs and giving them to people. Why? Because if you give them to people, they're going to listen, they're going to read. They're going to listen, they're going to read about who? About Hashem. That's sanctifying Hashem's name. If they learn about Hashem, if they think about Hashem, that's sanctifying Hashem. But if the only thing you're worried about is your own pocket, you're only going to do things because it affects your pocket, then it has, you have no connection to Hashem. And if you do, it's not a good one. If the only thing you're worried about is you, benefits to you, that means you have a negative connection with Hashem, if at all. If all you worry about is how much money you're going to get in your pocket and how much pleasure you're going to get in your life, then you're missing out on this mitzvah of sanctifying Hashem's name and most likely many of the others. Number seven, not to profane God's name, not to desecrate Hashem's name. Okay, you don't want to publicize Torah. You don't want to donate for Kiruv. You don't want to uh, you know, do good things to sanctify Hashem's name. Fine. At least don't desecrate his name. Don't go on the internet publicizing all the sins you make. Don't go on the internet going against the Torah. Don't go do things against the Shem. At least don't desecrate Hashem. Believe me, if we could simply stop desecrating Hashem, we'd be in good shape as a nation. Some people could literally lose their ulama by in one second. One second. How? By thinking they're doing a mitzvah. The satan comes to them with the, like the pig, with the good sign. Says, listen, give, give. No, no, come on, come on. Give him a chidush, give him a chidush. Give him a nice chidush for the Torah. Give him, give him. And instead of doing what Hashem says, which is to be quiet and listen, what does he do? He interrupts the shiur. He interrupts the tefillah. He causes other people embarrassment. Why? Because he wants to do a mitzvah. What mitzvah? There's a time and a place for everything. A person that embarrasses another person, if that other person doesn't forgive him, he loses all of us. A person can be thinking that he's doing a mitzvah, but in reality he's losing all of us. You have to feel bad for people like this. Why? Because they think that they're sanctifying Hashem's name, but in reality they're desecrating His name. Some people think that they're doing good by making comments against me or against Rabbi Mizrahi or against anyone that speaks the truth about Hashem and His Torah. They think that they're doing good by publicizing negativity about us, making fun of us on the internet, writing stupid letters, calling all types of people to, uh, you know, to hurt us and so on. People think that they're doing good by this. Or just by simply making a, you know, an, an insulting comment. Face to face or on the internet and so on. They think they're doing good. They think they're doing a mitzvah. What do you think the look on their face is going to be when they actually see what Hashem thinks of what they did? Number eight, don't destroy those things associated with his name. Doesn't really need much explanation. Something has Hashem's name on it, don't destroy it. There's a place of Torah, don't hurt it. There's a Jew that has Torah, that teaches Torah, that learns Torah, don't touch him. Don't hurt him. Why? He's doing what Hashem wants. You have to be very, very careful before you touch those people. Listen to the prophet who speaks in God's name. Somebody gives you a lecture, you read a book, you bought a book from Art Scroll, you bought a book from Feldheim, you bought a book from a kosher source, kosher publisher. That book mentions different things in the Torah that seem uh, odd to you. Why? It's like, Dariza, Sharagigulim, Gate of Reincarnation, starts telling you that, by the way, 
Before you were here, there's a possibility you were a cow. And before you were a cow, there was a possibility you were a plant that the cow ate. And before you were a plant, maybe you were a manure. And before that, you were a human being that really made a lot of sense to become manure. Oh, that's not nice. Oh, you don't like it? You going to go against the Ariza from 500 years ago? That was a Ish Kodesh, Malach Hashem? If that book has sources from the Torah, that person that wrote it is considered one of the Gedolei Ado. Before you decide to go say something against it, you have to think a million and a half times. Why a million and a half times? Because hopefully by a million and a half, you're going to forget what you're thinking about. And not say stupid things. Like some of these people on the internet, they say things, Hashem Yerachim, I don't know what the cookie they got this stuff from. They say things in the name of the Torah, in the name of their own opinion, that's against the Torah. It's almost like you think people are learning Torah from like a, one of those fortune cookies with their Chinese food. Making fun of Midrashim, making fun of the Zohar, Kabbalah, making fun of Chazal, making fun of rabbis. Now you would think, wait, no, don't we make fun of rabbis? No, we make fun of heretics. Very big difference. Heretics, mitzvah to make fun of them. Heretics, mitzvah to make fun of them. Rabbis, tamidech chamim, even if you disagree with them. So a person needs to know that if there's a book here, Rashi, Tosfot, Ibala Tosfot, Chazal, all types of stuff, Rishonim, Achronim. They wrote a book, they put a book. Can't go in against it. Even if you disagree, there's a way to disagree. If somebody repeats their words, even if you disagree, there's a way to disagree. Making fun of the other side is not a way to disagree. That's Chilu Hashem. That's desecrating Hashem's name by desecrating his people. So whether it's the prophet or it's obviously others that speak in the name of God, a person needs to listen to them. People treat Midrashim lightly as if it's fairy tales. Or like uh, one guy uh, says, uh, like it's a, um, what do you call it? Uh, fairy tales or some type of uh, insulting word about Midrashim and the Zohar. Mamash, complete stupidity. Last but not least, the Rambam says, number 10, don't test God. Don't test God. Meaning that, don't say, God, if you do this, I'll do this. God, if you're really there, show me. If you're really there, show, give me a sign. I'll test God. There's only one thing you're allowed to do. You're allowed to test them when it comes to Maasel. Maasel v'titashel. You're allowed to test God when it comes to him fulfilling what he promised, which is that he said, if you give Maaser on a regular basis, you give a tithe, you give a 10% of your income, your gross income, on a regular basis, he promises you that during your lifetime, you will be wealthy. He doesn't say how much time. It could be a week later, after you did it only one time, it could be 20 years later. But he promises you that you will be succeed. That's something that you, he wants you to test him on. Everything else you're not allowed to test. So if a person simply pays attention to these things, he sees that this rule book makes sense, has certain things that seem like they're strict, but if in reality they also make sense, and little by little, you can start connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But what does this have to do with Shemaim Va'aretz? What does it have to do with the heaven and earth? So the Rambam in Yesodei Torah, he says the following. In chapter 2 of Yesodei Torah, it says the first, first Allah says, it's a mitzvah to love and fear this glorious and awesome God as the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5 says, 
And you shall love God your Lord. And also in 6.13 it says, Fear God your Lord. So in mitzvah number two, it says, What is the path to attain love and fear of Hashem? How do you get this? When a person contemplates his wondrous and great deeds and creations and appreciates his infinite wisdom that surpasses all comparison, he will immediately love, praise, and glorify him, yearning with tremendous desire to know God's great name. As David Amelach says in Psalm 42, 3, My soul thirsts for the Lord, for the living God. In so many words, the Rambam is telling you that if soon as you start paying attention to the world around you, you will not only fear Hashem, but you'll actually fall in love with Him. Because you'll see how much good He's giving you. If he reflects on these same matters, he will immediately recoil in awe and fear also, appreciating how he himself is tiny and lowly and a dark little creature, standing with his flimsy limited wisdom before he who is perfect in knowledge. This acknowledgement of the world around you also creates humility, also creates fear of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Simply pay attention to the world around you. That's all. All you got to do is pay attention. Pay attention to the world around you. One of the greatest things that, one of the ways that you can see Hashem's glory is, is greatness is just simply looking literally at the world around you. You're on the road, for example. Take a break for a second. Get off the road and just look at the road. Look at how many cars are moving so fast. If one of them, if one of these cars just... The guy falls asleep. Hashem Yachem. Rav Ephraim's father, Rav Chaim, Rav Chaim Kachlon, Sheikhye, one of the biggest influences in my life is Rav Chaim. Rav Chaim, over 30 years ago, was a typical, traditional, non-religious Jew. Was a martial artist, I think he was either a brown or a black belt in karate, very muscular, very fit, also very educated, had a few degrees. But as far as religion is concerned, you know, keeping whatever he felt like it. But one thing that he heard the religious people do is that he heard that the religious people talk to Hashem. So he decided that every day he would go to his window at the end of the day and he would just open the window and look at the creation, look at the sky and how big it is and the heavens and the stars. It was just so wonderful and he just saw himself talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. No kippah, no special suit, no nothing. Now he didn't really know how the conversation goes so he figured, you know what? I'll just ask him for stuff. Hashem, you know, I need a car. Hashem, I don't know how I'm going to get this, but I need a wife. Hashem, you know, I, uh, I also need to have good health. Hashem, no one else is going to give I need money too. Hashem, I need this. Hashem. That's what he did. He just simply asked Hashem for a bunch of stuff. And he says himself, over 30 years later, it's before Tshuva, he says, everything I asked for, he gave me. It's unbelievable. One time I, I, I talked to Hashem, I said, Hashem, she's really sick. My neighbor is really sick. I hear her coughing. Please, please, Hashem, fix it. He says the next day she was okay. All types of things. You just simply talk to Hashem, what people call today, the Buddha Dut. But the Buddha Dut, before the Buddha Dut became popular. Simple Jew. Hashem likes simple Jews. But at the same token, Hashem has a certain amount of time He gives you to remain a simple Jew. So He talked to him and He talked to him and He saw and he, things come true, which you would think would naturally make a person, if he sees miracles, hopefully he would do tshuva. But what did I tell you yesterday? One of the primary lessons that we learned from the ten plagues, miracles do not make people do tshuva. You wanting to change as a result of some type of event, something happening, some obligation, some scare. That's what makes people do tshuva. 
So one day, Rav Chaim, before he became Rav Chaim, goes to a job interview. I think it was in Tel Aviv somewhere. And after the interview, it was around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So you wouldn't say it's 1 o'clock in the morning. No, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He's driving. And this athletic, extremely healthy person falls asleep on a wheel. Falls asleep at the wheel. And back then, they didn't have power steering, alarms, the car stops by itself as soon as you're off the road. None of that stuff existed back then. Back then, you were lucky if the, dry, if the car moved. Especially in Israel. Remember, Israel is at least one generation behind America as far as like development in many places. Today, it's starting to catch up. But like, for example, when like I, I, I uh, talk to people about the toys that I played with, nobody my age in America played with the same toys. Maybe your grandparents played with the same toys. Maybe. Some of the stuff we did in, America, in Israel, when I was a kid, people my age didn't have. Like, it's just, it's hard to relate to people my age. Why? Because they had a completely different childhood. Like, for example, every person my age, their parents had at least one car. At least one car, maybe two cars. And that was normal. Not, it had nothing to do with whether they're rich or not. It's just standard in America to everybody have a car. Standard for everybody to have a car. Standard for everybody to have a microwave. Standard to have all these video games and stuff like that. We didn't have video games for at least 10 years after America. Meaning by the time the, the video games that you guys were throwing in the garbage as like antiques, we finally started getting them. Car, only if you were rich. You want to go somewhere, walk. Or take a taxi. Or a bus. When I was a kid, we still played with donkeys and horses. Meaning we rode donkeys and horses as kids. Every day you'd see donkeys and horses in the street. That's the way we grew up. That's Israel. America is very different. So, how did I get to this? I think every time I think about how do I get to my own childhood all the time? I think that the shoes are more for me than for you. Have my, uh, my experiences. So, <laughs> so now, the Rambam here tells us that if you're going to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You're going to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. There's ways, there's how, there's who, there's one. And if a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives you miracles, gives you miracles, and you don't pay attention, he's going to have to up the ante. So my uncle, Rav Chaim, after he showed him a few miracles, and he didn't respond the way he was supposed to respond, Hashem upped the ante. He made him tired at a time you're not supposed to be tired. He fell asleep on the wheel. The car hit the rail, flipped a bunch of times in the air, all over the place. And he says, when he tells the story, he goes, from the movies I used to watch, used to watch movies, he says, from the movies I used to watch, Anytime this stuff happens, people would immediately come, ambulances and helicopters right away. So as soon as the car eventually stopped, like pretty much when the car was like rolling everywhere, first thing he thought about his mom, my grandmother, Aleya Shalom. He says, but after that, I said, huh, so this is how you die. Like, this is how it happens. It just happens. This is how you die. It's not like preparation. Hey guys, it was nice to see you. Love you. Here's a hug. Here's a hug. Rabbi Udaftaya. Rabbi Udaftaya, Allah wa shalom, in his book, he asks some of the uh, some of the dibukim that he talked to, some of the wuchot, some of the spirits that he talked to that already died. How come you didn't do tshuva? You knew Torah. He says, I didn't expect to die. By the time I died, the whole thing happened. The last thing I thought of was uh, do tshuva before you die. Yeah, I knew that you could do tshuva 
last minute, say, I'm sorry, do Shema Yisrael, do Vidui. I knew about all that stuff when I was alive and everything was good. But no one expects to die. It happens. The overwhelming majority of death is tragic. It's not like the movies where the guy is nice, old man, 99 years old, and he just goes to sleep after, you know, having his 99th birthday and everybody shows up and he gives everybody a hug and I love you and I love you and everyone's great and no one argues. And he goes to sleep, the old man, and he just goes to the next world quietly. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Death usually happens with... More like that, more like an action movie. More like an action movie. More like, ah! That's how it happens. That's how death happens most of the time. That's how death happens, Abutai. So all these dreams that people have, no, I'll do tshuva before I die. All right, good luck with that. Agav Chaim told us, when I was rolling in the car, I said, ah, this is how you die. I had one experience like that. I can tell you, the feeling that you're going to die is worse than death. One of the surgeries I had, I knew, I didn't think, I knew I was going to die. Now, I can't tell you about all the experience, because that's a different lecture of itself, but I can tell you for sure, it's worse than death. Worse. The feeling of emptiness, that this is it. That everything you've done until now is completely meaningless. All the money, the this, the that. Like, your whole world becomes worth zero. Because this is it. That feeling is worse than death. Worse. It's marmi mavit. Rav Chaim says, I was in the car rolling. I said, this is it. But eventually it stopped. So I said, oh, so the helicopters are going to come. So, so, so the ambulance is going to come. So the people, the people are going to come. I mean, he rolled, he's everywhere. He says, I was waiting, I'm waiting. And nobody came. No one came. So eventually he says, I had to fulfill the verse. Im ena nili mili. If I'm not for myself, who's for me? He let as I can said. And he got himself out of the car through the window. And when he was standing next to the car, finally the people came. And they're all looking at the demolished car. Demolished, demolished, looking, and everybody's crying. He's like, wow, poor guy, what happened to him? Wow, poor guy. I mean, scan, you can't even see it. You can, nothing is left of him. Nothing is left of him, the poor guy. He's like, no, I'm the guy. Huh? No one wanted to believe him in the beginning. He's the guy. Imagine... This car is demolished to nothing. A guy, muscular, with t-shirt and shorts, comes out, nothing untouched. But he says this. When I came out of the car and I realized the situation, I looked up at the same sky that I look up every night, and I said to Hashem, I understood I was in an obligation here. I understood something supernatural happened here. And I spoke to Hashem and I said, you're not going to regret this. And from that moment on, that's when his chuba started. How many people have a miraculous event, but don't do chuba? Many. Sadly, many. Sadly, many. One of the reasons is because not everybody's fortunate to acknowledge the Creator, not everyone is fortunate to talk to the Creator before they need Him, before the tragedy happens. What time are we in? What time is it now? Eleven sixteen. Eleven? Okay, so the introduction. That's good. <laughs> so, in order to understand the Creator, you have to look at the creation. You have to look at the creation. But then we're stuck with something. What are we stuck with? That on one hand, the Creator tells you, you have to look at my creation. 
because I don't have a I don't have a body, I don't have an image of a body. You have to connect to me through these five tools. But then we have something that the heretics like to point out, which is it seems like if you look at certain verses in the Torah, Hashem has a physicality. Seems like it. it says a strong arm, or he gets angry, or he saw, his eyes saw this, and so on and so forth. So the Rambam here says the following. In Allah number 7, chapter 1, Allah number 7, he specifically says, were the created to have a body or a form, he would have limitations and, and definition. Because by, de- by definition, it's impossible for a body to, be, to not be limited. Meaning in order for Hashem to be un, you know, limitless, to be unlimited, He cannot have a body, He cannot have an image of a body. Apparently the Christians don't get this. But then He continues, He says, Behold, it explicitly stated in the Torah certain things that, that contradict it though. What? On one end, it says, in Deuteronomy 4.9, it says, because God, your God, your Lord, is the Lord in the heavens above and the earth below. And a body cannot exist in two places. It can't be in the heaven and the earth at the same time. So that shows you that Hashem is not a body. And also in Deuteronomy 4.15, it says, for you did not see an image. He tells Am Yisrael, you didn't see an image. You, you didn't see anything. And the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 25, the Rambam says, to whom can you liken me? With whom I will be equal? Meaning, there's nothing that you compare me to. You can't compare me to any particular person, and so on and so forth. So now, what's the compl- What's the problem? There are certain things that say the opposite, like in Exodus 24.10, it says, below his feet. It mentions the word below his feet. V'tachat raglav. Or it says, written by the finger of God, or God's hand, or God's eyes, or God's ears, and the like. There's different expressions in the Torah. What is all of this? All of these expressions, the Rambam says, were used to relate to human thought processes, which know only corporal imagery, because the Torah speaks in a language of man, not in a language of God. Torah speaks in a language that you could understand. They're only descriptive terms as apparent from Deuteronomy 32, 41, where it says, I will wet my lightning sword. Obviously, Hashem does, does not have a sword. He doesn't need a sword to kill you either. Rather, this is a metaphoric imagery. All expressions like this are metaphoric imagery. And he gives different proofs in the book of Daniel, and so on and so forth. So now, what's the next contradiction? What's the next complication here? Is when the story with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu asks Hashem, please let me see your, uh, your glory. And Hashem says, no one can see my face and live. I'll show you my back. What, Hashem has a back? So the Rambam talks about it, and he says, Allah number 10. What did Moshe Rabbeinu see? What did he see here? What did, what did he want? Moshe, a teacher, envisioned Hashem. His visual of Hashem was like as a mighty man, a warrior, waging war on Mount Sinai, but the reality, this was all prophecy. So what, what was it? Moshe Rabbeinu was asking to comprehend Hashem by saying, Areni night kvodecha, by saying, please show me your glory, he has to know the truth of the existence of the Holy One, blessed be He, to the extent that it could be internalized within his mind, just like a person knows a particular person whose face he saw and whose image has been engraved within his heart. Thus, this person's identity is distinguished within one's mind from that of any other man. Similarly, Moshe Rabbeinu asked that the existence of the Holy One, blessed be He, be distinguished in his mind from the existence of any other entity, to the extent that he would know the truth of his existence as it is in its own right. In simple English, 
You, for example, don't need to see your friend every time you talk to him. Once you see your friend one time, you see a person one time, even if he calls you six months later or six years later, if you have normal memory, he's your friend, you you spend enough time with him, he calls you six minutes later, six months later, six years later, he calls you, he's not seeing him, it's not Skype, simply calling you, or he sends you a letter. When you're reading that letter and you know it came from your friend, you have an image, you have a visual in your mind of what, who wrote this letter. His face, his ears, his eyes. Why? Because you saw him once. Your mind has a certain image of this person once you see him once. So even if you see him from the back, walking down the street in the middle of New York, there's three million people on Broadway. But you see the back, but you know this is your friend. Yeah, but you don't see his face. But you know the shape, the outer shape of your friend and how his ears look like from the back and a certain image of his profile and the three chins that he has. You know what he's got. So you don't need to see his face. Simply, you know, that's him. That's, that's my friend. I grew up with him. It's my buddy. Or better yet, you don't even have to see him. You just hear his voice. And then he has one of those voices that's distinctive. You know his voice. This is what Moshe Rabbein wanted to know. He wanted to have a certain type of image of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, so he's never going to ever confuse anything with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. He wanted to make sure that Hashem, I want to have you in your mi- my mind at all times, so I don't want it to be my Yetzirah that's telling me to do something, but in reality, uh, I'm thinking it's you. That's what Moshe Rabbein wanted. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu granted him almost what he wanted by revealing to Moshe Rabbeinu matters which no other man had known before him nor would ever know after him. A certain knowledge of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his truth that no other person would ever see or feel or so on that would distinguish in his mind from any other entity. Just like a person is distinguished from other men once he sees this person. So he gave him what he wanted, but it wasn't a physicality. It was something else. So that's how we explain that sugya, that, that issue as far as physicality. But still you see how the Torah has answers for everything. The Torah is an explanation for everything. Now, The next step is fulfilling all of what it says. Now, to fulfill all of what it says, a person needs to know that Hashem, that created these rules, these five creations, all we talked about is just the first couple. The Torah, Shemaim Ba'aretz, both the Torah and the Shemaim Ba'aretz have a good and a bad side to them. There's a way that they're implemented into the world. They're put to use into the world. How? By people. So the next Kinyan is Avraham. Avraham Avinu. Avraham is one of the Kinyanim, one of the possessions of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Why is Avraham? Why wasn't Noach mentioned? Why wasn't Adam Arishon mentioned? I mean, technically it should be Adam Arishon. Why was Avraham mentioned 20 generations later? At least, why wouldn't it be uh, Noah? Okay, so let's say Adam Arishon messed up. Fine, what about his son? His son was a tzaddik, no? Okay, no, fine, oh, not enough. All right, let's just go all the way to the generation of Noah. Why wasn't it Noah? Why wasn't it Noah? Noah was a tzaddik. Ish tzaddik tamim bedorotav. Hashem testified he's tzaddik. Why wasn't it Noah? This whole generation was destroyed. You would think, technically, Noach is the one that all of us, Jews, non-Jews, everybody, are B'nai Noach. Everybody's a B'nai Noach. So how come? If it's not Noach, what about his son, Shem? Shem was Tzaddik. Am Yisrael comes from Shem. What about Evel? When uh, Yaakov went to learn Torah, 
When Yaakov went to learn Torah, where did he go learn Torah 14 years? With the yeshiva 14 years, he learned Torah consecutively more than anybody in history. 14 years straight without a break. If we could learn 14 minutes without a break, checking our phone, it's a miracle. 14 years, Yaakov Avinu, 14 years straight without a break. Today you can't learn a shield Torah without checking your phone. 14 minutes, check your phone every 14 minutes, just see somebody text you, somebody WhatsApp you, somebody this you, somebody that you. You start looking for messages. You didn't get a message in the first place, check somewhere else. Oh, nobody texted me? Psh, what, what's going on? What's going on with people today? What, people forgot about me? Let me check WhatsApp. Let me check WhatsApp. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm in these groups. <laughs> I'm in these groups, yeah. Yeah, they say, look, 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 I'm in these groups. Oh, it's not for me? Oh, it's the other mic? Oh. Wow, nobody, nobody WhatsApp me. But they forgot about me? What, did I die or something? Maybe I should make a post. Maybe I should make a post, tell them I'm still alive. Why aren't you WhatsApping me? You know what? Nah, forget it. I'm gonna dishonor myself. I'm gonna embarrass myself. WhatsApp. Let them WhatsApp me. Huh? No, no, I'm gonna go to Facebook. Go to Facebook. <laughs> Messenger. Ah, see, got it. Hey, Steve. What's up, buddy? I love you. Yeah, I missed you. I haven't seen you in a while. Starts talking to a guy. He finally found a message. Fine. If nobody messaged him, hush, <laughs> shalom, do, do, do. Hush, shalom. He, he looks for messages. He looks for messages. Why? What? I died? Nobody's messaging me? How about the Shield Torah? Kapar Alecha. How about the Shield Torah? How about you finish the book? How about you do something? Stop looking for messages. Yaakov Avinu did not look for messages for 14 years. Where did he go to Yeshiva? Yeshiva Shem Vaever. But then we have a problem. How come Yaakov Avinu didn't go to Yeshiva of Avraham and Yitzchak? Why? Avraham, Yitzchak, Avraham did not have a Yeshiva? Of course he had a Yeshiva, huge Yeshiva. Yitzchak didn't have a Yeshiva? How do you have a Gdol Ado without Yeshiva? How come Yaakov, the grandson, didn't go to Yeshiva of Abba and Saba? You went to the cousins. You went to Shem Vaever. Why did you go to the Yeshiva? Why didn't you go to Avraham? Why don't you go to Yitzchak? Because Yaakov Avinu knew he is going to where? Levan's house. Levan is Rasha. Levan is the worst of the worst. Levan is worse than Esav that he's running away from. He's so bad, I'm going to him, and I know for sure Esav is not coming. Why? Esav is scared of Levan. Esav that killed Nimrod, most powerful person in the world is scared of Lavan. Just imagine. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend time with Lavan. I need special training. Okay, so go to Avram. Go to Yitzhak. No, I can't go to Avram and Yitzhak. Why not? Avram, he's at a different level. He's a different level. Yitzhak is from, from birth. He can't teach me. I got to go to somebody that's about Tshuva. I got to go to somebody that saw the biggest Rashaim in the world. Who could it be? Shem. He saw the door of Abul. He saw the biggest Rashaim in the world. Not do tshuva even when the Abul was falling on them. I got to go learn from him. Why? That's the only thing that could save me from Lavan. That's why the Mesilat Yesharim, the Ramchal, says, you want to go learn Torah, go learn from Abul Tshuva. Why? He'll teach you. He'll teach you how to stay away from Rashaim. He'll teach you Torah Temet. Of course, there are many tzaddikim that are not Baalit Shuva. They're Baalit Shuva every day, but not in the same context that you learn from. But you understand the meaning. But now we see here that still we haven't answered the question of why a Kadosh Baruch Hu picks Avraham and not Noach. Why Avraham and not anyone else? Why isn't it Yaakov? Why is it, why is it Avraham? Because 20 generations have passed from Adam Arishon. And technically the, creation, the plan for creation was that the Torah was going to be given to all human beings. Originally the Torah was given to Adam Arishon. Then there was an extension that was given to Noach. First six laws of Noach were given to Adam Arishon. After the Mabul, 
Hashem gave the seventh law to Noah, so now there's seven Noahide laws, and it's called based on Noah's name because he's the one that in essence completed it. But in essence, the Torah was supposed to be given to everybody. But even after the generation of Noah, we see 350 years approximately later that they tried, that it became Rashaim again, the Tower of Babel. Ten generations from Noah to Avraham, again they became Rashaim. To the extent that Hashem almost destroyed the world again. And then Avraham came through. Then Avraham came to the world. Avraham came to the world and made it all worth it. So even though the world, in essence, was the Torah was supposed to be given to the whole world, Hashem saw how all of mankind were sinning. And after 20 years, 20 generations of failure, the privilege of being God's chosen people was earned by Avraham and his offspring, says the Ramchal in Derech Hashem. What does that mean that Avraham earned the right to be Avraham, the right to be the chosen people, the father of the chosen people? What does it mean? Hashem ran out of patience? We just said that Hashem does not subject to patience or anything physical. He's not subject to something that body or, or thought or anything like that. He's, Hashem is not like us where we are separate from our knowledge. We acquire knowledge, we forget knowledge, we're separate from our knowledge. Hashem is not separate from His knowledge. Hashem is one with all of it. All of it is united. That's also part of the understanding of uniting Hashem. There's no separation in Hashem. His knowledge and Him are one. The past, present, and future, all the same to Him. So, what does it mean when it says that 20 generations have passed? Hashem says, okay, the heck with them, I'm going to make Avraham Avinu chosen. Father of the chosen people. So what does it mean? Hashem ran out of patience? So I had a chidush today that explains it what Chazal is already saying, but explain it in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that maybe is easier for the ear. Hashem doesn't run out of patience because He's not subject to patience. But Hashem runs the world with a certain system of reward and punishment, measure for measure, cause and effect. So it wasn't a matter of 20 generations of failure, Hashem ran out of patience. Ah! Um, the heck with you. No. There's a reward and punishment. After 20 generations, what happened was two things. Another generation made the sin that lost their right. Because of the sins, they lost their right to be the chosen. On the other hand, Avraham Avinu earned the right to be the chosen. So it wasn't that Hashem ran out of patience. It's that Hashem had to reward Avraham and punish everyone else. It was a cause and effect. It, wasn't a, it was an outcome of everyone's actions. Not Hashem running out of patience like us. When Hashem punishes somebody, it's not that He runs out of patience. It's that that is what it eventually leads up to. In essence... You kept putting drops of water, drops of water, drops of water into the canister. In the beginning, thinking, oh, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. There's a lot of room in this canister. So I could just leave this and go to sleep and I'll be fine. The next morning, you see the whole thing spilled everywhere. You're like, I can't believe it. How could it be? It was only one drop at a time. Because one drop on top of another drop, on top of another drop, on top of another drop, a bunch of drops after a while start filling up the canister. Eventually, it overflows the canister and everything falls all over the place. One sin after another sin, in the beginning, the sin doesn't seem like a big deal. But eventually, it fills up to the top where Hashem says, okay, now it's time for punishment. So it's not that Hashem runs out of patience or wants to punish. But there's a cause and an effect. So... We see that Avraham earned his way. Why did Avraham earn it? 
What did he do to earn it? It says that Avraham Zacha Biglal Shehu Zika Et Arabim. Avraham merited to become the chosen because he benefited the public. He merited the public. He was the original Kiruv Rabbi. He was the original Kiruv personality in the world. Adam Arishon failed. Noach failed. Shem Ever, everybody else failed before him. Not a, not, they were not all Rashaim. There were actually other righteous people even during the generation of Noach. There were righteous people of the generation of Noach. There were other righteous people of the generation of Avraham. But Avraham is the one that merited to be the one that's chosen. More than Shem Evel. More than even the sons of Noach and grandson of Noach that were actually saw the Mabul. Avraham merited. Why? Because Avraham did Kiruv. Why is Kiruv such a big thing? Why do we have some, uh, some uh, you know, uh, bias here? No, no. Why? Because Kiruv is a person, show, when a person does Kiruv, when a person invests their time to teach other people about Hashem, invests their money to teach other people about Hashem, invests their effort to teach other people about Hashem, directly or indirectly. He either sponsors it with his own money for a rabbi to do it, or for the CDs, or for the books, or whatever it is, or he does it himself, or a combination of both, or he goes on the internet and, and, and instead of checking his email, he shares the lecture and so on, all that stuff. When a person does Kiruv, he is showing Hashem something special. What is that something special? That you understand the Creator and His desire. Why? Because the Creator is good. What is He good with? By creating good. If you want to create good, the number one good that a person can do is emulating the Creator, being just like Him. How can you be just like Him? By sharing knowledge of Him with other people. By connecting other people to Hashem is the ultimate good. So even though Noah was righteous in his own, he didn't get the message. He didn't share the knowledge with the masses. Even though Shem and Ever were righteous, they didn't share the knowledge with the masses. Anytime somebody came, they did it. But they didn't go out there looking to help people. Avraham, anywhere he went, he went to look for, to help people. He went to help them understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that's running the world. And when a person emulates the Creator by benefiting the creations, in essence, he is enough of a reason for Hashem to create the whole world for. That's why Hashem says to the Prophet Jeremiah, Im karmi zolel If you take a precious you turn somebody into precious when they used to be a lugger they used to be a sinner you turn the sinner into someone precious into someone that actually serves me you'll be like my mouth so rashi alamakom says wait a minute uh, what does that mean you'll be like my mouth hashem says to the sages hashem says to the prophets he says just like i created the heaven and the earth with a word of my mouth, I said, and it came to being, you will be the same. You pray, I'll turn it into reality. You ask, I'll turn it into reality. There are certain tricks, if you will, inside this Torah blueprint of what Hashem told us, there's certain things that you can do to make things happen. To make things happen. For example, if a person does a Birkat uh, Amazon, when you say, usually you'll see when you open your arms and uh, he, he, he satiates all beings, usually you'll see small little letters in between it. Those small little letters are small names, are holy names of different servants of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
one of the names starts with the letter, the first letter of Potech et Yadecha, Pei Aleph Yud, that's a certain name of Hashem, but another name is a uh, Samech Aleph Lamed. Why Samech Aleph Lamed? This also, this is the same numerical value as the first one, 91. Potech et Yadecha, the Pei Aleph Lamed, is, were, is valued at 91. Samech Aleph Lamed, also valued 91. But this is also, a, why do they pick this out of any other combination? Because this Samech Aleph Lamed is also a name of Hashem. But this name of Hashem is a special name of Hashem, that if you think about it during this Bekat HaMazon, with the other one as well, it's a Zgulaf HaParnasa. Why? Because it's this specific name symbolizes that you not only know where the Parnasa comes from, but you also know that at the end, you can't take it with you. Because Samech Aleph Lamed means Sof Adam Lamavit. The end of man is death. So don't spend all your prayers just on money. So a person that thinks, wants to have Zgulah for Parnasa, he thinks about these names. A person that wants uh, to, to have good panasa does Birkat Amazon at least once a day with Kavana. A person that wants good health does Asher Yatzah with Kavana. A person that uh, wants to have uh, miracles happen in their life does everything they possibly can, money, time, effort, into Kiruv to get more and more Jews to become servants of HaKadosh Baruch Hu instead of themselves and their money and their bosses and their girlfriends. There are different things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that you can do that are special. Maser. Somebody wants to get Maser, that's say, way to become rich. Want to speed up the process? Give 20%. Instead of 10%, you give 20%. But the point being, Abutai, is that there are certain codes, if you will, within the Torah to make certain things happen. And... Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu is teaching us that if a person wants to make everything happen to them, where they're going to be preparing themselves not only a benefit in the next world, but also a benefit in this world, to emulate the best of creation, which is Avram Avinu. Why? Because he emulated Hashem. He emulated Hashem to the highest level. He did Kiruv at a time where he was the only Jew there. There was nothing else. When you have a kolel over here, a kolel over there, a kolel everywhere, you know, it's easy. But when the whole world is against you, the whole world is against you, and you're still going, that means you get the message. That means you understand. Now, everyone else during his generation went the opposite. We'll talk more about that. Next week, Be'ezad Hashem, things that have to do with Sodom and Gomorrah, Hashem Yachem, that have unfortunately have become popular today. Uh, also, uh, the other Kinyanim that we have left, which is Am Yisrael as a whole, and also the Bet Migdash. Why are these two entities, if you will, or creations, so critical for the world to exist? But I can, and then use these verses as a something to take things into account when you're thinking, what should I do with my life? This is the type of Mishnah that you're supposed to remember for the rest of your life. But I'll leave you with one story. We talked a lot about Kiruv. We talked a lot about effort. We talked a lot about all the different things that Avraham Avinu did to make himself special. Almost 80 years ago, over 80 years ago, there was a Gdola Do named Rav Wasserman, of El Khanan Wasserman, which I've told you stories about a few times. He was one of the main Talmidim of the Chafetz Chaim. Rav El Khanan Wasserman, Rav Shalom, was committed to his students to the extent that he would not allow himself or his family to eat chicken 
unless there was chicken for all of his students meaning his family of a few people were not allowed to eat chicken if he, if he didn't have enough chickens for 400 students his own son that was tzaddik said when he was a kid it's the worst to have a, to be an orphan even though you really have a father that's how much he loved his students one time he went and he found out that there's no money for the kids to eat there's no money for the kids to eat there's no money and the last thing in the world he wants to do is to leave his bet midrash Judaism in the world is deteriorating people are becoming bigger and bigger shine intermarriage is skyrocketing Zionism is destroying Judaism is destroying Judaism it's illegal to be a righteous Jew so the few that are righteous that you have a few hundred that you have in your Bet Midrash I mean you gotta do whatever you can to protect them to keep them in to keep them alive why they go there's no more purpose to the world there's not like 5,000 of these places like today there's a few, few here, few there, a few Alita in Radin, a few places around Europe. No, there's not many places that have tzaddikim. So you literally have, in essence, the nuclear bomb of the entire world. Here you're Bet Midrash. And unfortunately, you don't have food to feed it. So even though he was committed to Torah and everything else, he says, I have to go look for money. And one of his trips... He went, he decided to go to the UK before Mirvis, before Malach Mirvis. He decided to go to the UK. He came to a house and as soon as he came after a day and a half trip, it's not like today, a few hours, you're already in the middle of the world. Day and a half trip. Finally arrived, came to the house, went upstairs with a suitcase literally minutes after he came a woman came to the house knocked on the door they opened the door it's like oh somebody's here for you he came downstairs this woman he never met in her life he never saw her in her life gave him 500 uh um what 500 dollars or 500 a uh, not euros uh no zeus is many many years before that pounds 500 pounds Give him 500 pounds. Thank you. Left. Didn't change. Not a tweak. Nothing. Serious person. No, like, hey, so how's your husband? Nothing. Okay. Went back upstairs. Took his luggage. And says, okay, I'm going back home. He says, why? He goes, I got what I needed. I didn't come here to build a bank. I came here to get food for my kids to eat. Because, yeah, but if it's already so successful after the first one maybe a few more days uh, you get more money because I got what I needed I need to leave now you just traveled for a day and a half I'm leaving now he left in that moment that was a successful trip but unfortunately not all of his trips were successful another time the kids were hungry the kids were hungry the world was going down. If sexia was ruining things, anti-Semitism was everywhere. The Rav was in a situation where he had to get money for the kids. He had to get money for the teachers. He went again to the UK. He went to one after another, one after another to all of the, the rich people in the UK. He went to the UK and went, please help the kids. No. Please help the kids. No. Not a single person donated. He got nothing. The entire trip. I think it was two weeks. Zero. Zero. Nothing. Now I want to ask you. All these people. All these formerly rich people. What do their faces look like right now in Shemaim? when they're showing them this movie of you could have given 500 pounds, you could have given 500 dollars, 
you could have given one hundred dollars, five thousand dollars. We gave you millions in this world. Hashem gave you millions in this world. You could have given five hundred pounds to none other than the Gdol Adol. And that 500 pounds would have saved Judaism, would have saved Am Israel from the Holocaust. But you did it. For $500, you could have saved the Holocaust. For commitment, for caring, for Mesirut Nefesh. Just a little bit of sacrifice. That is all it takes for Hashem to say, you know what? I'm not going to destroy Sodom. Why? There's 10 people that care. There's 10 people that understand what the mission in this world is. You have people that have money in the world today. They have, but they don't give. Not for Kiruv. For everything else they'll give, but not for this. And the reality is, hopefully, some of them are going to watch this. Because right now, in the world, we have something happening that unfortunately, Hashem Yerachem is preparing the next Holocaust. Because the statistics, as far as intermarriage, are worse today in the world than they were before the Holocaust. The statistics of anti-Semitism today are worse than they were before the Holocaust. The amount of crime against Jews today are worse than they were right before the Holocaust. Everything is worse. We can stop the next Holocaust. We just need people that care. So, those people from 70, 80 years ago could be you. Could be somebody else reincarnated, given another chance. But the reality is, is those people that weren't given another chance, they're looking from Shemayim, from whatever chamber in Ganom they're in. And they're saying, listen, you could have actually gotten Gan Eden. More, and not only that, we made it easy for you. It's not like we sent you some like new guy, new Baal Tshuva, no one really knows where he came from. No, we sent you Gdol Adol. We sent you Rav Wasserman to go and, and, and actually collect from you. still said no. Meaning it had nothing to do with the person. It had to do with the cause. You cared less about the cause. And if you care less about Kiruv, then you care less about Hashem. If you care less about Hashem, you lose your right to live. You have no point of your life. Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu only created you in order to sanctify His name. And the way to sanctify His name is by emulating Him, by being like Him, by being good. And being good means you do good. The ultimate good is introducing people to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Any questions? There was no Noahides uh, versus Jews in that time. Everybody was in the same boat. Everybody was in the same boat. Meaning that a, uh, he taught everybody, with the exception of a, uh, his own household that did more than others because they had more of the Torah, the rest of people, uh, all everybody had the same obligation. Whereas today it's very different because we're after Matan Torah. And we have Am Yisrael, that is the chosen people, the descendants of Abraham Avinu, that have a much higher obligation uh, that's much more difficult to fulfill uh, than the Noahides. A Noahide could arrive at a, uh, the understanding that they have an obligation to God uh, through much simpler forms, because all of the Noahide laws are logic. A Jew could never get to the point of serving a Kadosh Baruch Hu the right way without the appropriate daily teachings of what Torah says. So while a Noahide could 
learn the basics relatively quickly of what they need to do, is at least knowing what to do, not necessarily knowing how to do it, relatively quickly, a Jew cannot do it. The second thing is the obligation is higher on the Jew than it is on the Noahide, because the Jew is the chosen one versus the Noahide is not. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't teach Noahides. This means that the, there's priorities. There's priorities. Just like, for example, yes, you may want to, for example, save you know, all, of the, uh, all of the soldiers, but your obligation is to save the president first. Why? He's priority. It's not a matter of you like him better or you don't like him better. This is the rule of the land. This is the rule of the ruler. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that the Jew takes priority over the Noahide. Even if you have, to the extent, even if you have a thousand Noahides are willing to pay you to come give a lecture, but only one Jew is willing to attend the lecture for free, you have to go attend to the Jew. It's to that extent. The magnitude is significant. But that's also why Hashem has a much lower obligation for the Noahides as far as what they're learning, which means that they could learn all of our Musar series and they would be able to fulfill their obligation for Hashem simply from our Musar series. Because that's all they need to learn. They need to learn Musal. That's it. Whereas a Jew cannot only learn Musal. A Jew has to learn Alakha. He has to learn a, uh, the, the holidays. He has to learn how to practice them and so on and so forth. Whereas a Noahide simply has to learn Musal. So... It's much, much easier for a Noahide to fulfill his role than it is for a, uh, for a Jew. So in essence, by teaching Musa, we are technically doing both. We are reaching out to a lot of Noahides. Baruch Hashem, we have countless Noahides that watch almost every Shi'u. Uh, but at the same token, if, uh, if, if we had to, let's say, for example, divide our time or money, where would we be obligated to invest according to the Torah? We'd be obligated to invest into Jews. Priority over no heights. Doesn't mean we don't invest into no heights. It's just priority. If there's uh, no, uh, you know, for example, if there is a uh, uh, free day or the, you know, the lecture for Jews was canceled and the Noahides invite you, you have to go and, and help them. It's a mitzvah to help Noahides to become righteous. Uh, but it's a, again, there's a priority. Uh, and because we have such a lowly generation uh, in a sense of knowledge, uh, and a high, uh, uh, sig- a high amount of ignorance in the Jewish people today that pretty much it's all pikuach nefesh. It's considered all pikuach nefesh to the extent that Arabi again, Allah Shalom, says that his first seminar that he ever did, right before the seminar, he injured his back. And uh, he called the, uh, the organization Arachim that organized the seminar and canceled. He's not coming because he had so much pain. And the doctor told him, if you're not going to lay down in bed, you're, you could hurt yourself seriously, permanently. It could even be a life risk. Because the bone is in this certain place, and so on and so forth. So he called a uh, well-known uh, rabbi, and his wife answered, the rabbinit. And he, the rabbi wasn't available, but the uh, rabbinit was talking to him on the phone. He sa- she said, so you have the seminar coming up. It's like, yeah, yeah, but I canceled. She says, why did you cancel? He says, well, my back, my back is such a bad, I heard it. The doctor says that it's pikuach nefesh. She says, chas v'shalom. Take a bunch of uh, uh, dressing and all types of things, wrap your body up, get yourself together and get to that seminar immediately. She says, yeah, but I have uh, I'm a pikuach nefesh. She goes, no, you have safek pikuach nefesh. You have pikuach nefesh that's doubtful. It's not 100% that you're going to die from this back situation. It's possible, but not 100%. But all those people that attended to the, uh, to the seminar, they're 100% going to die if they don't listen to you and do tshuva. They're all at life risk. Every second that they're alive is borrowed time. Any person that does not keep Shabbat is living on borrowed time. Any person that does not fulfill the Torah is literally living on borrowed time. So to not go help him is, I mean, it's 100% pikuach nefesh. 100%. So, obviously, he listened and went, and Baruch Hashem did a lot of good because of it. But point is, that's what we do what we do. There's a lot of times that, uh, especially uh, um, when I don't feel well, uh, that I uh, almost call off the lecture, 
But I remember constantly the same a couple of times that we had uh, almost canceling the lecture in the past that I spoke to my rabbi and he gave me the same exact argument saying, listen, you don't feel good, understand, it's terrible, it's horrible, it's this, got it. But you're not going to die. It's possible, but no, not likely. They, whoever is going to come to your lecture, 100% they're going to die if they don't listen to what you say. So he says this. So, for example, I had an event. I think it was either Montreal or uh, California. I don't know, some event that I had one time. And I felt terrible before it. Like, you know, the type of pain that you almost want to commit suicide. And uh, it was really, really horrible. I didn't want to leave the house. He's like, okay, listen. So he tells me this. He goes, okay, fine. She's not going to go? Okay, so just do me a favor. Let's just do it together. So just start praying for all of them to die immediately. I said, what? No, I'm just not going to go to the event. He goes, okay, so fine. Don't go. Let's just at least pray for At least do them a favor. Pray for all of them to die. So that at least they die now and don't make any more sins. That's my rabbi. You understand? A person does not understand what kind of danger he's in when he's not doing shuvah. So, yes, we want to help everybody. By the same token, we have to help uh, the, the priority first and uh, everyone else after. If we can help everybody at the same time like we do with Musa, then we do that too. With Baruch Hashem. It's, uh, I think there is a uh, uh, at least equal amount of Noahides to the amount of Jews that we've helped over the years. Uh, some Noahides ended up converting to Judaism. Some are still Noahides and will remain Noahides, but Baruch Hashem are very, very righteous and good people. They know what they're doing. Uh, so it's, uh, we don't close the door to anybody. It's just that uh, we have to, there's unfortunately, limited resources. What else? We said that next week we have a show on uh, Sunday, Bezat Hashem in Sunny Isles. Uh, a, uh, the Bitachon series, which Baruch Hashem has been getting some good feedback. And then we'll continue with this Mishnah next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, Bezat Hashem at, uh, in Aventur at our new uh, location. Uh, for anybody that uh, still has not gotten CDs to give out in their community, please, maybe you don't have any money, but you can't complain that you don't have any time. You don't have money to donate, don't donate. No one's asking you to donate something that you can't donate. But donate your time. Send us, your, send us an email with your address. Tell us a little bit about your community, how big it is. We'll send you 100, 200 CDs. Take a half hour, give them out in your community. Uh, at least do that. It's free for heaven's sake. It's free. It's free. If you don't have time, then that means you have to have money. Why? Because you don't have time because you're working so much. So then donate the money then because this is costing thousands and thousands of dollars every single day. Just today it cost me like four or $5,000 to start the week. So if you don't have time, that means you're really busy with, with making money. So at least donate money. If you don't have, if you don't have money, that means that you probably have a lot of time because you probably just work nine to five and uh, do nothing for the rest of the day. Okay, so donate some time. Donate a half hour, an hour of that time and give out some CDs. Do something for heaven's sake. Do something. Holocaust, Hashem Yachem, is not uh, just something in the past. Hmm. Not just something in the past. We have to understand that. I'm serious. It's funny, but it's not funny. If we don't give out these CDs, if we don't continue spreading Torah, to get people to do tshuva, we're all gonna lose. Don't just think that people that didn't do tshuva are gonna lose. All of us, me, you, everybody. Why? Because, call Israel Arabim Zelazeh. What do you think? Tzadikim didn't die in the Holocaust? Bunch of them died. What do you think? Abbas didn't die, they slaughtered him. And all of his students. Sadiq is so alive, Kodesh Kodeshim, what a Kodesh he had. But they killed him. Why? Amisad didn't do tshuva. Yeah, but he was righteous. When there's a decree from Shemaim, everybody dies. Do you understand? If people don't start doing kiru, the ones that are watching, the ones that are here, the ones that are not here but are going to watch tomorrow, if people don't start doing kiru, we're all going to lose. All of us. No one will be spared. That's what people don't understand. They think, ah, it's okay, he's fanatic, he's eh, eh. 
That's what he's told. They made fun of Abu Asana and in the Chafetz Chaim. He tells us in his book. He used to make fun of them. I give lectures. Make fun of them. Ah, you guys are fanatic. You guys are crazy. This Torah is ancient. He used to make fun of them, the Germans. German Jews. Make fun of them. Until they slaughtered them like chickens. You understand? Kiruv is not a suggestion. It's an obligation. Especially when you can do it for free. Where whether you don't have money or you're cheap, regardless of the problem. Now you can do it for free. So Mamash, it's it's it, now the uh, the kitru, the judgment on somebody who, who refuses to do kiruv is exponentially higher. Because now it just simply means you don't want to do it. Not that you can't do it. You don't want to. And that's a serious problem. Because that defeats the purpose of the creation. So please, Abutai, if you haven't already volunteered to give CDs, jump on board. I'll give you CDs for free. If you have money, please donate. If you don't have money, don't donate. Donate, whatever. The point is, everybody has to do something. Am Yisrael is mama suffering. People are literally, like almost every other person you meet is suicidal. No one knows why they're even in the world. Everybody's depressed. Everybody's on Prozac. Everybody's on ADHD. Everybody's on some type of uh, uh, painkiller or uh, something to numb their mind. Mm. It's time. It's time we do something. And with other shem, break to the world. Amen. Amen.